I'd like to call the Lane County Board of Commissioners regular meeting for Tuesday, January 23rd, 2018 to order. And the first item of business is adjustments to the agenda. Any adjustments to the agenda? No. Seeing no adjustments to the agenda, we'll move into item two, which is public comments. And everybody will have an opportunity to address the board for three minutes. I have a timer up here. I'll start the timer after you've stated your name and where you're from for the record. So uh, I will call the first person up and note the second person that's kind of on deck so you can be ready so we can kind of keep this moving because we do have a very full agenda this morning. So the first person for public comment is Victor Odlevac, followed by Jerry Rust. Good morning, I am here again uh, several times. So I wanna try- you state a, your name and where you're Oh, my name is, you know me already all these times. <laughs> my name is Victor Odlovac. I live in Eugene at 1620 Lorraine Highway. And I'm um, speaking, I'd like to put on a hat that I wore 43, 44, 42 years ago, I was a high school physics teacher. And we'd like to have a very simple physics lesson, uh, bring some bright moments into the room. In the words of Rasan Roland Kirk, I want these spirits to be with me. I want Albert Einstein to be here with me. So my great, great, Grand uncle's first cousin is Albert Einstein, and he liked to sail. So we're going to take a different tack. So you guys are all in my physics class, and it's equal physics, whatever. I've got, you know, I've got like a water cooler. And I'm going to take that water cooler, and I'm going to buy that, you know, Roundup at the store. I'm going to take a little dropper, just a little dropper, and I'm going to put it in it. Stir it up, watch it, everybody sees it. I did the roundup. <laughs> I'm not gonna even go for the atrazine, the 2,4-D, all the other god over stuff. It's all sitting there. Now I want you guys to raise your hand how you would respond and everybody in the room. So, is there anybody, anybody <coughs> testify that will drink that water? Okay. I think the case is closed. You won't drink that water. Your children won't drink that water. We won't drink that water. You can say now we are doing what happened in Carlsberg, New Mexico. We are banning this without even voting it because we have the power and we're going to protect the people. But if you want to vote, give us the vote. Whatever way you want. Give us the initiative, put it to a vote, and you want to call a meeting, right after we're all speaking, then do that to discuss it. But look, you've all said it. You've all spoken the truth. Nobody raised their hand and said, I'm going to drink that water. So you pedal along Fox Hollow, where I pedal regularly. And that is where this person lives, Lynn Bowers in Eugene, and is on hospice and is dying of cancer from that sprain. So all us bikers, we pedal along Fox Hollow, and we see the sign sprain. And we're inhaling that. Nobody would drink the water. Case closed. Thank you. No applause, please. Jerry Rust, followed by Pam Driscoll. Jerry Rust, 92396, Highway 126, Florence. Uh, actually, there was a guy, Mike Newton. He was OSU professor who uh, promoted uh, 2,4-D, and he actually did drink some. That's supposed to be funny. It's a true story, too, you know. Um, I, uh, I'm one of the people who signed that petition to get it on the ballot. And everyone who signs a petition has a reasonable expectation that the government is going to do its part and follow through and have a vote. Now, I understand that there are some legal complications and you're now in a bind. 
let me suggest a potential compromise, <clears throat> and that would be to get a, an advisory vote before the people. Shall aerial herbicides be banned on forestry operations in Lane County? Yes or no? Real simple. If it passes, you would be uh, instructed by the public to perfect an ordinance that could then carry through with the will of the people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. Pam Driscoll, followed by Bernadette uh, Baressa. Hi, my name is Pam Driscoll. I live in Dexter, Oregon, and Gary Williams is my representative. The last time I spoke, I brought up the fact that Pat Farr said on December 19th that he didn't want to burden us with a response, and I did listen to your response because I had to leave since it was a middle of a Tuesday, and you denied that you said that, so you need to check your facts, Mr. Farr. You did say you did not want to burden us with a response, and then your your response last meeting was that you had grandchildren and somebody has passed away that you really respected. One thing I've noticed um, at these meetings, because we seem to be coming regularly, is you guys don't really give us a response. I think you're afraid of going on record, because you can get all this on the webcast, and everybody can uh, see and hear what you say. So there really is no decent response other than let the people vote on whether poisons should be aerial sprayed. That's the only decent response. That's maybe why you're not giving a response. Because once again, I'm pulling out the article from January 3rd in the Register Guard that states Jay Bozovich, who has raised $53,000 towards his reelection campaign, Bozovich and fellow commissioner incumbents Lycan and Williams are taking money, especially from the timber industry. Crestwall loggers, landowners Norman and Melvin McDougall donated $10,000 each to Bozovich and Lycan. Gustina Resources gave Bozovich $5,000 and Lycan $1,000 last year, while Dan Gustina made $2,500 contribution to Williams. Wild Leach Land Company gave Bozovich and Lycan $5,000 each. Delta Sand and Gravel Construction Company donated $5,000 to Williams' campaign last month. Well, who is Melvin and Norman McDougal? Oh, they're scoundrels. That's who they are. Everybody should go read this article that was in the Eugene Weekly titled Timber Theft. And it basically talks about all these stories where Melvin and Norman McDougall do pretty uh, deceitful business practices where people who have tended the land for 60 years in some cases do not want to do not want to sell their land to Norman and Melvin McDougall. So they find a back way to sell it to someone else, and then they end up taking the land and clear-cutting it. So that's who you guys are taking your, your campaign donations from, and that's who you're working for. And, um, you know, it's, it just comes down to what you should really do is be working for the people. I keep saying it again, and I don't get any responses from you all on why you should continue to allow aerial herbicide, which is poison, sprayed from helicopters, that go into people's property, on their pets, into the wildlife, our waterways, our air. No excuse. You have the power to let us vote. Let the people vote. So Bernadette Barrasso followed by Carol Schiller. I agree with everything that Pam Driscoll just said. My name is Bernadette Barrasso. I live at 85409 Eagle Zary Road. Just a um, South Eugene uh, Commissioner Williams district, um, and I thought I'd open up by uh, referencing a book I read about forty years ago. Actually, I only read the first little part of it is what I remembered. Um, it was called Seven Arrows, and there's a line that said, "The one thing that all people share in common is their loneliness." And I was really pretty amazed by that. I had to read it over and over and over. Um, I knew I had a great deal of loneliness, and I was looking for answers in my life and trying to remake my life. But I couldn't believe that all the people around me who look so happy and, and engaged in life would be lonely. It just didn't seem right, but I believed it. And I've thought about it over these last 40 years. 
Um, so I'll just let that sit there for a minute. Because we all come from different places and sometimes we seem to be at odds with one another, but we all have a lot in common in, in what we're trying to do with our lives and where our decisions come from. And so I hate to criticize someone else for, for their decision, uh, whatever it may be, but sometimes it does upset me. I'm currently reading something called The Book of Joy. Uh, the Dalai Lama and the Reverend Desmond Tutu got together to celebrate their 80th birthdays. And a fellow uh, spent the week with them and recorded a lot of what they had to offer us. Uh, the Book of Joy. And uh, the Dalai Lama talked about that sometimes we have fear and it can lead to anger. Um, and there are a lot of other emotions in there too. And I, so you guys are being presented with this decision to make. And I'm just wondering where you're going to come from, what your emotions are going to be, what, uh, what's important to you when you make this decision. Um, and like Pam said, I think that spraying poison on people should just be sort of a simple thing and we shouldn't be afraid to make that decision. So you anger the timber industry, some of your friends maybe, but we can, we can get past that. If they're your friends, they'll still be your friends. Uh, maybe you won't get reelected because the public will be so mad at you, but that's okay, something else will happen. We're all old enough that um, we don't really, here in this room probably, we don't wonder where our next meal is gonna come from or if we're gonna have to sleep out on the sidewalk. Something will come along uh, and we're all going to do okay. And if we can go forward sort of unafraid, we can make the world so much better than it is. Everyone knows that. Uh, the amount of money we spend on war right now, we got to transition out of that. We got to transition to cleaner energy. We know all these things. Um, and just send, you know, we want to get rid of cancer. We got to. We gotta stop spraying poison on our water and our food. So anyway, you heard me a couple months ago maybe uh, take a vow to stick with this particular issue even though I have a lot of things. And this morning I just wanted to update you on that, that my next- Thank you for that. You're oh, well I have to go, your, my time's up. You're, you're well past three minutes now. Oh, I didn't hear it, okay. I'm gonna be seeking endorsements from businesses. We've got a good start. So Carol Shearer, followed by Andrew Frost. Good morning. Um, I'm Carol Shearer, and my, um, I'm a cons constituent of uh, Commissioner Williams. Here's a quote that I cannot take credit for. It's from Alan Alda on the program uh, Star Talk. We are not really listening unless we are willing to be changed by the other person. I've been trying to find out if I am being listened to by my commissioner. I have in the past sent emails regarding other issues that I've cared about and received nothing back. I have left a voice message, very detailed, saying I'd like to have some communication. I could meet, I could talk on the phone, or I'd welcome an email back. The last time I was before you, which was the last time you had a session for the public, I asked Commissioner Williams to comment afterwards regarding the aerial spray ban. I believe he was the only commissioner that did not comment. And other times I've been here and there's been issues, I've not heard him talk. So um, I would hope that Commissioner Williams is listening, which again means that he would be willing to be changed by what he hears. So perhaps today we'll hear from Commissioner Williams or perhaps I will get an email or a phone call or I will be invited to meet with him and we can have a communication and hopefully there will be listening. Thank you. Thank you. So Andrew Frost followed by Logan Overton. 
Hi there. Uh, my name's Andrew Frost. I'm from Glenwood. I'm here basically about taxation without representation, something which should ring a bell. I went to see the... I phoned up first. Oh, basically, your property tax comes in on the 15th of November. The bill was sent out on the 25th of October. Now, if you're away for a month, you have no means to pay that bill, no means to estimate that bill in advance. Most companies give you a month to pay. I think the, the county could certainly afford to give a month on payment, as other counties do. The idea that the discount is not applicable if you're over that time, there's a discount if you pay straight away. I'm fully willing to pay. I'm willing to support the tax. But what I'm really pissed about is the fact that I get 21 days notice and I'm abroad for a month. So I have no means to pay that bill. Now, Mr. Lykin, we've spoken about this and you sorted it out, Mr. Uh, Coles, I think his name is. But the fact that I went to, sp I spoke to his staff member, I then phoned up the senator, the congressman, and half the commissioners of Oregon, half the district representatives, and phoned up and spoke to them. I went down to the office and then asked him, I said, here's the check for payment in full, as if I'd paid in time, as if you'd sent me the bill in time. Now, he'd signed off on the 5th of October that he, well, these were the assessments, yet waited to the 25th of October to send it out. I believe this is a scam in order to get a few people that, can't, that aren't having automatic payments and stuff to have to pay the extra 30, 40, whatever lack of discount that they get. But the, one of the most annoying things about this whole thing is the fact that I went up, I went down to see him. He told me he wasn't going to do anything, so I said I'm going to go up and see Mr. Lykin. I went up to see Mr. Lykin, and while I was in the offices trying to arrange an appointment with Mr. Lykin, talking to Beanie, who I phoned, said there was no problem with the way I talked to her. A policeman comes up behind me and threatens me to leave the building because Mr. Coles is annoyed as he, to quote him, you phoned up the commissioners, you phoned up the senator, you phoned up, I'm like, hey, dude, you do not bring a policeman to threaten a constituent away from speaking to his representative because you're annoyed with the fact that your constituent thinks you've done a bad job. I had no threatening behavior. I have the same angry tone I've got now. And so I really do dislike being threatened by a policeman. I filed a report with the sheriff's department, but the report is really against that tax assessor who believes that the police are there for his own personal protection. That is not true. I am allowed to seek representation without being threatened by the police over taxation in the USA. I think you would all understand that. Thank you. Thank you. So Logan Overton followed by Rob Dickinson. All right. Uh, my name is Logan Overton and I reside outside of uh, Cottage Grove. Uh, let's see. I went ahead and did some research after the last session on the top three most uh, top three most used pesticides in the United States. The first called metolechlor. That nobody online had a pronunciation guide for it, so forgive me on that. Uh, apparently, in studies, it would cause on lab rats at any rate. Pup weights and parental food consumption decreased decreased at this low dose, as they put it. Another two-year test causing the wasting of testes at moderate moderate doses. And and they say it's a possible human carcinogen, but not to a notable degree. And metolachlor is uh, moderately toxic to both warm and cold water fish, including rainbow trout, among others. And it's apparently mobile in the soil, easily leached, and res uh, resists breakdown for a long period of time, meaning if it gets sprayed there, it's just going to stay there for a long time. If the land use converts at some point, if it gets sold off, the next person is going to have some... Uh, not exactly uh, organic space to use. The next, uh, the famous uh, atrazine would uh, cause 40% of rats who were receiving oral doses of it to, mm, they would get respiratory diseases, paralysis of the limbs, that sort of thing. 
and uh, apparently uh, a lot of uh, growth, uh, they would uh, slow down their growth. And of course, as I already elaborated on in last session in frogs, it would convert their gender and in, in some cases even make them viable female uh, frogs. Really strange. It implies that maybe in higher species it could do something, but it hasn't been studied or observed appropriately yet. And uh, the final, uh, the final, uh, the most used uh, uh, chemical uh, glyphosate, the famous one used in Roundup. Honestly, I couldn't find that much bad stuff about it, so I'm not surprised somebody would drink a thing of water with it in it. It's labeled as a possible carcinogen, and but the downside of it is it stays up into the soil around 140 days. It's half-life, and it'll just keep the area inorganic for a long amount of time. And as to Commissioner Bozovich's comments in the last public session, that he or the board could be held personally accountable for referring the aerial spray ban to the voters because it violates state law, it's an extreme, this is an extreme doubt. Our ORS 30.285 states that the governing body of any public the governing body of any public body shall defend, save harmless, and indemnify any of its officers, employees, and agents, whether elective or appointed against any tort claim or demand, whether groundless or otherwise, arising out of an alleged act or omission occurring in the performance of duty. Referring, referring a ballot initiative would be part of the duty of an elected official, so it would be covered under this law. The only cases I've found on the internet of public uh, commissioners being held accountable for anything is if they accidentally do something outside of the scope of their duty that hurts someone or uses public funding to push a political agenda, as was found with some weird water fluoridation case where it was seen that it wasn't a public awareness campaign, but rather a political push. But if there is indeed any possibility of personal accountability arising from this, I would uh, advise that they would should uh, um, be aware that... Um, Perhaps people will come up uh, every single time that a person gets ca cancer in this county that there could be personal liability alleged or the fishing industry from reduced yields and uh, reduced salmon runs. Thank you. Rob Dickinson, followed by Brenda Klusman. Good afternoon, Commissioners. I'm Rob Dickinson from 31755 Gowdyville Road in Cottage Grove. Before I address my um, primary remarks, I'd like to point out that um, a number of us are quite disappointed um, that we've had um, repeatedly requested a meeting with Commissioner Williams, but have so far been unsuccessful in having a chance to have that um, meeting or discuss this issue in person. Um, I've emailed on January 5th, January 11th, and yesterday, and those emails have gone unanswered. So we're hoping that Commissioner Williams will, will meet with his constituents or at least respond to their, um, their messages. So I'd like to address today the concern by some that the Freedom from Aerial Spraying of Herbicides Bill of Rights Ordinance could be preempted under state law, and that this might create a problem with the fact that all commissioners have sw sworn an oath to uphold state law. Um, the summary is there is no conflict here. Uh, first, as was previously acknowledged by Commissioner Bozovich, it is the current law of this state that is unlawful to determine pre-election whether an initiative is subject to preemption or not. The Oregon Supreme Court in the case called Boitano versus Fritz wrote that even if a matter is subject to state preemption, it may none, nevertheless be the proper subject of the initiative and referendum power. So you do have that ability to refer it without concern for the preemptive law. Second, not only is preemption not relevant pre-election, there are only two rules that are constitutionally required uh, to apply to initiative before it is put to a vote of the people. Those are the single subject law and the full text rule. The Freedom from Aerial Spraying of Herbicides Bill of Rights a Charter Amendment which is the exact language of the proposed ordinance that we handed to the commissioners on January 9th, was determined by the Lane County Clerk, Cheryl Betchar, to comply with both of these rules in her determination issued in September uh, 21st of 2015. Similarly, the Community Self-Government Charter Amendment, again, the exact same language as the proposed ordinance provided at the last meeting, was also determined to comply with both of these rules on October 2015 by the Lane County Clerk. There are no other pre-election requirements that apply to proposed ordinances. In short, these ordinances as drafted and supplied to the commissioners 
are eligible now for the ballot. Third, we are urging this Board of Commissioners to use um, your power of referral under state law to put the Freedom of Aerial Spraying of Herbicides Bill of Rights Ordinance and Community Self-Governance Ordinance um, on the November ballot in Lane County. We're not asking you to endorse these initiatives or even to vote for them. We're asking you to use, simply use your power of referral provided by state law to allow the people of Lane County to vote on these important issues. Thank you. Thank you. Brenda Klusman, followed by Jim New. Brenda Klusman, uh, I live in Springfield, Mr. Likens' um, area. And I'm here also to appeal to you to have a work session to d decide on whether to refer the, our two initiatives to the ballot. Aerial spraying is a violation of our rights and must be stopped. Over 30,000 Lane County voters have uh, submitted, have, have signed our petitions calling for a vote on aerial spraying and to respect community self-government. You, our elected representatives, have the authority to refer these two initiatives to the ballot and we're asking you to do so. We're demanding you, dis you do so. Last night at the Eugene City Council meeting, uh, public comment was given that uh, in support of the council to endorse the Declaration on Human Rights and Climate Change, which I have a copy for you in my hand. And this, our, uh, our two initiatives play right in, uh, re uh, relate right in with this climate change declaration. Uh, climate change is human rights, is animal rights, is environmental rights. It's all interrelated and aerial spraying is in direct violation of all of those rights. Um, to Mr. Lichen, hundreds of Springfield residents, if not thousands, have signed these petitions asking to have a voice to oppose or approve um, the community rights and uh, aerial spray initiatives. It would behoove you along with the rest of the commissioners to support a work session, to, to have a work session and give the vote to the people. This is not, as Mr. Lichen, as you and I discussed, you said that this, you felt that this was a state level issue. Yes, it is, but even more so, it's a local issue. The local people in our county have spoken already, and we deserve the right to have the vote. Thank you for your consideration, and I hope that you will schedule this work session very soon, and that, Mr. Lichen, that you will follow through with our multiple requests for a small group meeting with you to discuss these issues. Thank you. Jim New, followed by Robin Bloomgarden. County Commissioners, my name is Jim New. I live in Ward 7. I read this letter to the Eugene City Council and Mayor last at last night's council meeting. An immediate concern I would like to speak on tonight is the aerial herbicidal spraying by the timber industry of endocrine disruptor chemicals poisoning the E-Web watershed and the drinking water of Eugene. This practice has been an issue for over 40 years, protected by the right to farm rule under the Oregon Constitution and enforced by a rotating number of Lane County commissioners. However, according to Justin Workman and the Freedom from Aerial Spraying Herbicides Alliance, drift spray of these chemicals is shown in water samples near an E-Web intake canal. E-Web is a public utility owned by more than 200,000 taxpaying citizens that receive energy in 7.5 billion gallons of potable water per year who elected you and the county commissioners to ensure this utility provides abundant energy and clean drinking water. Governmental bodies are the trustees of the public trust, fiduciaries to protect the natural resources held in trust from damage, as well as privatization damages to all of our natural resources. Our most precious natural resource, water, has now been compromised by third-party corporations, the timber industry. They have sprayed 2,4-D with amine, 2,4-D with ester, 2,4-D with choline, glyphosate, fluoroxypor, penoxalin, and I can go on and I can't mention all the words. 
spell, say all the words that are on here, and numerous other endocrine disruptive chemicals that cause thyroid disease, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, birth defects, fetal infant and child illnesses, growth disorders, sexual dysfunction, tissue orders, and hormone-related disorders. Most of these chemicals are banned in other countries. The city of Eugene is considering a resolution adopting the Declaration of Human Rights and Climate Change. Principle, principle two states all human beings, animals, and living systems have the right to a secure, healthy, and ecologically sound earth system. Principle five states all human beings, animals, and living systems have the right to the highest attainable standard of health free from environmental pollution, degradation, and harmful emissions. Principle nine states all human beings have the right to information about and to participate in decision-making processes related to alterations made to the physical environments they rely upon for health and survival. How can the city adopt this resolution and not speak out against aerial, aerial herbicidal spraying? 30,000 Lane County residents have signed two initiatives, Freedom from Aerial Spraying of Herbicides, Bill of Rights, and the local self-government charter amendment. These initiatives should be before the voters this year. We ask the mayor and council to challenge the system, be advocates against the, this violation of our resources and protect our water from herbicide aerial spraying. As county commissioners, you have the authority to schedule a work session to discuss this matter publicly. Commissioners could make an ordinance opposing herbicidal spraying and elect to refer the initiative to the ballot. You are not being asked to endorse the initiative, just put it on the ballot. Thank you. Thank you. So Robin Bloomgarden followed by Michelle Holman. Commissioners, my name is Robin Bloomgarden. I'm in Gary Williams district. Commissioner Williams, you are the only commissioner who has refused to meet with your constituents over the issue of the aerial spray ban. You are paid about $85,000 a year, plus benefits, to protect the people of Lane County from harm. We'd like to see some action from you, Gary. On January 9th, Chair Bozovich, supported by Commissioners Sorensen and Lichen, agreed to schedule a work session for the board to discuss the referral of our two initiatives to the ballot, since the board's hands are tied over the single vote rule. Mr. Farr, have you signed on to a work session yet? And if not, why not? Mr. Williams, do you plan to just sit this one out as you've been doing so far? You all are responsible for protecting the people of Lane County and our immediate environment from known toxins and poisons, but I don't see any evidence that four of you are the least bit alarmed about the spraying of poisons over people and animals on a regular basis by your timber interest friends. I've learned that today, timber revenue today, Timber revenue accounts for barely 2% of the total economy of Oregon. They'd like us to think it's bigger, but it's not. Of course, it's timber money that gets you reelected regularly. I see that that's why you lean towards protecting them and not us, the people who also live out there. Timber workers know they are in danger too, but are afraid to say anything. What does that tell you? Let's make this happen together so that we will all be winners. This ban will add hundreds of jobs to the forest by putting people to work on the ground with backpack sprayers, putting small amounts of poison directly where it's needed, rather than bombing a whole ecosystem at one time. It's not perfect, but at least minimal people, wildlife, and farmyard is affected negatively. When do you plan to... Um, schedule a work session. I'd like to suggest how about today right after the public comment period. Thank you. So Michelle Holman followed by Joe Burney and if I could get the next sheet please. Michelle Holman, Deadwood, Oregon. I understand that you are going to talk about the work session today. Uh, it's on the agenda and I would like to ask that you move it up while we are here because that's why we're here. The room is filled with people who came to listen to you discuss when that's going to happen. Uh, if you could have the consideration to move it up while we are here. Many of us are workers and we're taking time off. So uh, that's my first plea. Second, I would like to acknowledge uh, people's movements over time. 
They usually start with uh, a group of harmed individuals trying to ro uh, right an injustice. And they tend to move out with allies who join their movement, uh, moved by, um, I guess, courage. After that, the culture changes and the leaders follow the people. Um, in Lane County, we used to have um, field burning, right? That was a legalized, protected activity. That no longer exists. Um, a little further back, black folks ha didn't enjoy the same civil rights as white people. That was changed. That was changed by a group of people who decided that they could no longer deal with this injustice. Allies joined and the leaders followed and law was changed. Uh, before that, women didn't have the right to vote. Men joined the movement. The leaders followed. The law was changed. Don't be afraid to change law. Law is not ensconced in concrete, and people's minds change, the times change, our understandings changed. I believe that chemical applications on our forests are going to go the way of the dinosaur. That is not going to exist forever. Our bodies can't handle it, and the earth can't handle it. And you can play your active role right here in Lane County. People are looking to us. We can lead. Follow your people. So I've got Joe Bernie, and then I'm getting the next sheet here for the next person. So go ahead, Joe. Come on up. And on deck is James Barber. Uh, Joe Bernie, uh, Sid Lichen lives in my district. <laughs> um, and Michelle, you're so cool. Um, okay. One dark aspect of the history of this wonderful nation are attempts by established power to maintain control over citizens in fundamentally anti-democratic ways. These are often legal roadblocks. While technically consistent with, either the, with the letter of the law, they intentionally circumvent both the spirit and intent of the law to preserve the status quo. Some states enact voting statutes to make voting more difficult, especially for certain historically excluded people. Gerrymandering districts is often the effort of politicians currently in power to control who gets elected instead of letting the people decide. The most blatant attempt to silence citizen engagement, which is the hallmark of democracy, citizen engagement is the hallmark of democracy, is putting obstacles in the way of citizens proposing, discussing, debating, and yes, voting on citizen initiatives. Citizens discussing, debating, and voting on citizen initiatives ought to be celebrated, not denied. Excuse me. Our commissioners are choosing to be enemies of democracy and acting like bad bureaucrats. A good bureaucrat helps citizens get what they need. A bad bureaucrat creates obstacles, making something that ought to be easy extremely difficult. I have owned and run several businesses and organizations successfully. Frankly, I would not hire most of our county commissioners because I don't hire people to tell me why I cannot do something. I hire people to figure it out and get it done. As a reason, leaders do not hide behind intentionally placed preemptive litigation. They enable democracy and when they become the obstacles, they should be removed. As a result, I, Joe Bernie, am coming out of a comfortable retirement to offer Springfield residents an alternative to our current anti-union citizen initiative squashing, often inaccessible county commissioner. Because, Sid, and it's nice to meet you and there's nothing personal, it is clear by your actions and the actions of this body, or more accurately, the lack thereof, <clears throat> that the business of government is far too important to leave to career politicians. Thank you.
Deborah McGee, followed by Loretta Huston. Houston. Me first. Oh, James, sorry, I went right by you. <laughs> sorry, I wrote something in the wrong line. James Barber, Commissioner Williams District and candidate for East Lane County Commissioner. Uh, I, one thing to note, I didn't see any items on the agenda that were time certain, so maybe you could move up the work session to right after the commissioner's responses and remonstrances so that uh, we can all listen without our parking meters running out. <laughs> kind of makes it tough sometimes. Uh, that said, uh, we no longer live in a time when we have to sacrifice our health in order to prop up business. People and animals are being directly sprayed. Animals are affected by breathing this poison and drinking it as it enters our watersheds. And it's the epitome of privilege to say that these people and animals have to suffer and die so that businesses can make a profit. For that business owner to say a few bucks in his pocket is worth more than these people's lives or health. Their ability to harvest our natural resources is not more important than our access to clean air and water. We have alternatives. We don't have to use these poisons in this manner. That's a choice someone is making in order to maximize profits. We've done the heavy lifting of gathering the signatures to show that there's broad support among your constituents. I think most people are familiar with the term, if you see something, say something. Well, we've seen something and we've said something, and now we're asking you to do something. So I look forward to the work session. Let's figure out a way to move forward on this. Thanks. Thank you. Now Deborah McGee, followed by Loretta Houston. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Deborah McGee. I've lived in the county um, off Lorraine Highway in Peaceful Valley for over 30 years. Uh, Gary Williams lives in my district. America is in a democracy crisis. Over the past 40 years, dark money has made its way into our legal and political realms. Our democracy is being destroyed by capitalism, which is causing extreme inequality. Capitalism is the pursuit of profits without the consideration of other values and needs. Since money is speech, a small minority of folks, in this case the timber industry, is exercising their free speech, spending money, which enables them to poison the majority for their profits. While these poisons should not be used at all because they are not necessary, there are less dangerous methods of using these poisons, but that would cost more and cut into their profits. The advance of their wealth is at the safety and well-being of the people. You are complicit in increasing their profits and harming the safety of the people. Americans want a government that represents all of us, not the 1%, not the 10%. Time's up. Time's up. The people refuse to continue to be poisoned. You need to protect our safety and well-being. We wish that you would help us. You could support our efforts to allow people to vote on the two ballot measures that would help protect citizens. You have that authority. You could enact legislation to protect our health and safety. The people will no longer accept being poisoned. Do the right thing. Protect the people from aerial spray. Thank you. Loretta Houston, followed by David uh, Devet, I think. Good morning. Uh, Loretta Houston, uh, I'm in District 5 with uh, Commissioner Gary Williams. Um, I just uh, text, I just emailed you last night. I do appreciate that you responded immediately. Uh, we really would appreciate meeting with you in person to have a candid and honest conversation about these serious issues. So thank you for responding immediately. Um, I'd like to address flawed laws. Why are more and more people frustrated with laws? Because the system is extremely rigged and outdated. Even when people play by the rules, such as the community, community rights of Lane County, which has spent countless volunteer hours over two years to turn in 30,000 signatures for two single issue initiatives that were recently threatened by the county commissioners to veto our process, and now the county has thrown in another barrier of a separate vote rule. Just think about it. 
it is a separate vote and that we are voting on two separate initiatives to ban aerial sprays and the right to local self-governance that have passed the single issue threshold. When it comes down to it, why is it legal to poison and damage our most complex ecosystems here on Earth? Why do we waste time playing out this so-called legal battle while the corporate timber giant continues to clear cut at an accelerated pace with bigger machines while bankrupting our counties, states, country, and ultimately our planet into extreme desperation and destruction? Not only does this outdated practice erode rich soils, expose damaged soils to tenacious invasive species, dump tonnage of complex toxic, toxic chemicals into the soil, water, air, and every living creature that walks, swims, and crawls, but ultimately destroys the very foundation and equilibrium of life here on Earth. Indeed, we are living in tumultuous and unprecedented times in which cancer is one in three for every male and one in four for every female. And the cost of severe damage due to this insatiable appetite to exploit, profit, and dominate every living species and raw resource on Earth can never, ever be cost effective to restore and reimburse what once was. We ask you simply to do what is right for the greater health of our communities and complex ecosystems by taking the first step to, de to support the democratic process of our local county initiatives to ban aerial sprays and the right to local self-governance. After all, laws are simply made by flawed human beings that can be challenged and changed to meet the demands of the times and the voice of the people. Thank you. Thank you. David, and if you want to help me with the pronunciation, your last name, followed by Kev Kevin Matthews. Yeah, David Tveit. Uh, so my name is David Tveit. I live at 801 Lynn Lane in the River Road area. I'm in Pat Farr's district, and thank you, Pat, for answering me this morning about uh, you, that you support the work sessions. Um, I understand the work session that's on the schedule today uh, will pertain to our uh, initiatives, and uh, I also would like it if it, the work session could be moved forward so it is more workable for more of us to attend. Um, also, I'd like to make a brief aside about a comment about glyphosate that was made earlier today. Um, I think a deeper exploration of, of uh, the research on glyphosate will bring out there are more and more problems coming out about glyphosate. Lots of research is being done now, and more and more health issues are tied in with glyphosate. Another thing that has come out is that uh, some of the inert ingredients with some of the glyphosate mixes, because there are many different glyphosate mixes, Roundup is the most um, common one, uh, the inert ingredients, it has been discovered, can often be more toxic than the glyphosate. Um, glyphosate is considered one of, has been considered one of the safer herbicides, and maybe that is the case still, but you're comparing it with 2,4-D and atrazine and some other ones. But one of the uh, mixes with uh, glyphosate that's been discovered is arsenic. And we're, in using those mixes, we are poisoning our land with arsenic also, besides glyphosate. Anyway, so... I'll move on with my what I originally intended to talk about. Many people in Lane County are adversely affected by aerial herbicide spraying and want this egregious chemical trespass of private and public property stopped. Aerial herbicides spraying from helicopters clearly results in chemical drift. For the herbicide that actually lands on the intended target, some of it some of it will revolatize and go back up into the air where the wind currents take it to contaminate other properties. Between sp stream spray over drift and revolatization, the oil, the, the water, air, and soils of Lane County are being continually contaminated worse and worse by these poisons. Please hear the people of Lane County and support us in being able to vote on both these measures as ordinances. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin Matthews, followed by Linda Davis. <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you. 
Good morning. <clears throat> I'm Kevin Matthews, um, Lane County native. Um, I live in Dexter, where my wife and I work to preserve the Akalteki breed of horses. I'm a candidate for East Lane County Commissioner because uh, four years ago, a group of citizens came to me and asked if I could be somebody to represent them in moving Lane County forward. This problem that you're creating around blocking the citizens' right to pursue democracy guaranteed under Oregon and county law is an example of why I was recruited at the grassroots level. I'm not going to try to repeat the strong remarks that I made last time we talked to you about this. This is round three. Uh, round two was January 9th. Um, my remarks are at one hour and 18 minutes in the webcast on the, on the county website. Um, <clears throat> but it appears that you have little interest in chemical issues. Um, it appears that you have little interest in fairness issues. It appears with three rounds of mass testimony and no substantive response to, the, to date, it appears that this is pure power politics. I will note, to underline that, um, the suggestion from my, my good friend and long-term former county commissioner, Jerry Rust, the idea of putting an advisory vote on the ballot completely cuts through any of the legal issues that have been raised. Um, there's some reasons why it's not a great idea, but it's in front of you. It's an option that you could take if you want to give some kind of substantive response rather than just sit pat for your big contributors. Um, I also really appreciate the comments of my friend My friend in Springfield, Joe, who's running for commissioner against Sid. Because Mr. Bernie, as a fellow business leader, highlights the difference between problem seeking and problem solving. And you gentlemen are acting in a classic problem seeking mode. If you want to seek problems, you can undermine and disintegrate anything, including such a fabulous place as Lane County including such a fabulous thing as American democracy. So wouldn't it be nice if we could get around the power politics and work some kind of, you guys have to work the compromise with the guys who are giving you those big checks. We can't do that for you, but you could do that for us. So Linda Davis followed by Bess Noble. My name is Linda Davies, and I am in Jay Bolshevich's district. Thank you for hearing us today. And I just want to say that this is the second time that I've taken time off of work to come and um, hear the comments and, and give a comment today. And I want to stand here for all the people that would like to be here and fill this room beyond accommodation on this issue who can't afford to take off a day of work. Not that I really can either, but this is um, very important to me. I live out in the country and worked my whole life to be able to finally afford a little peace in the country and felt like I'd stepped into heaven and um, realized quickly how naive I was when I realized that poisons were being sprayed overhead on a regular basis. I also work on an organic farm and it's a constant stress and concern. What's being sprayed around us? Is it going to impact our food? I've been trying to eat organically since the early 80s and accomplished that as much as I can, but when the poisons are being spread on my land where I grow my food or my water table, um, there's really not much I can do about it except appeal to the government to help us. The people are speaking very loudly, 30,000 signatures is nothing to you know, sniff at, and I can't believe listening to everybody's um, voice and what they have to say that this can't be touching you guys in some way. And I would just like to appeal to you on a more humane level that 
I'm sure most of you are married and have children and maybe even grandchildren. And just think how you would feel if your grandchildren were coming home to your home that was sprayed by um, pesticides and you worried every time you poured them a glass of water or fed them food grown in your garden. Um, it's a real thing. And you guys have to find it in your hearts to understand that. You wouldn't sit down with your grandchildren and pour them Clorox for breakfast or give them a Tide Ball to eat for a snack. You know, poisons are poisons, no matter how you look at them. And there are other ways to do what the timber companies need to do without doing aerial spraying. I've seen it done, I've fought for that, and seen it accomplished on a very small scale. And there's no reason why you guys can't help us accomplish it on a big scale. And what somebody said earlier is correct. You will be the leaders then who followed the people, which is what government is really supposed to be all about. You'll be the heroes. And you'll have to work things out, but I'm sure you can. And we need to. It's time. Thank you. So Best Noble followed by Alan Stein. So Alan. And Alan's the last person I have signed up. I'm so lucky. I've been in bed for five days. I have a bad back. There are thousands of people out there who'd like to, to voice their opinion right now. So I want to say thank you for people who came here. Alan, could you state your name for the record? Yes. My name is Alan Stein. Thank you. I live here in Eugene, Oregon. I have a business downtown. I pay my taxes. When I was 16 years old, I watched my mother die of cancer when she was 42. Okay? You've heard about cancer. What I'd like to do right now, that I got your attention, thank you very much, is that I created a jingle on my way here. Jingles are very simple, that I hope you could remember it and everybody here. And it kind of goes like this. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you. Shame on you. Can people sing with me? Is that legal? Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you. I'm sorry, but we... Is that not public, okay? It's not okay. Okay. I apologize. Thank you. How, many, how much time do I have up here? At a minute and 56. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you. Shame on you. I'm glad you're grinning, because I'm not grinning. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you. Thank you. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you. There's a lot of people that are working today. A lot of people are going to school. A lot of people can't be here. And you know what they're saying? Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you. Shame on you. How much time do I have left, please? Got 105 now. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you. This is not funny. People are dying from this. Please stop laughing at me. I've been in bed. I'm very serious. How much time do I have, please? 47 seconds. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you. I came to one of these meetings about six months ago. I saw no progress with you. I saw 30,000 people sign a commission to say we need to stop this spring. And we have 40 seconds left. Shame on you, county. Oh, is it my correct, sir? How many seconds left? 20. Thank you. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you. Shame on you. I'm going to give you 10 seconds to think about that jingle. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you, county commissioners. Shame on you. Shame on you, county commissioners. Not you. You're a good man, Sorsen. Shame on you, county Alan. commissioners. Thank you. Shame on you. Thank you. I appreciate this time. Have a good day.
I'm going back to bed. So that was the last person I have signed up. And uh, is there anyone else out there that didn't get a chance to sign up that wants to address the commissioners? Come on up and say your name uh, for the record and, and where you're from, and we'll give you your three minutes. Richie Gross, Deadwood. I have a little jingle also. Sorry, guys. <clears throat> it's actually a radical piece of literature, which we all occasionally need to be reminded of. <clears throat> we declare that all people, when they form a social contract, are equal in right, that all power is inherent in the people, and all good governments are founded on their authority and instituted for their peace, safety, and happiness. And they, the people, at all times, have a right to alter, reform, or abolish that government at such manner as they may think, pa as they may think necessary. We don't have a spray problem in this country. We have a democracy problem. The dollar has become votes, and the almighty international corporations have become people. Things will change because we will survive. Thank you. I didn't see anyone else raise it. If you want to come up and state your name for the record, please? Yeah, I'm Thomas Brown. I live in Glenwood. And I just, you know, I've noticed you guys stifling some yawns up there. And I imagine it's because you're losing sleep over this issue. Uh, if you're having nightmares about ballot boxes and ballots falling on your head, um, you can do something about it. Um, and if you've changed your mind and you're going to uh, uh, allow this on the ballot, I will apologize to you. But until then, you should know that the anger in the, in the county is growing, and um, we're going to do something about it. Thank you. Thank you. One last call. I think we got everybody then. So that will end public comment now, and we'll move on to uh, commissioner's response to public comments and or other issues and remonstrance. Any commissioner's response? Sure. Commissioner Farr. Thank you. You know, thanks for the input today. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about when board meetings are held. A couple of people have talked about the fact that the board meets at 9 a.m. on Tuesday mornings. Historically, we've met at n on Wednesday mornings prior to my big coming here, but uh, we relinquished this hall on Wednesdays for the Eugene City Council. Now, I spent 10 years on the Eugene City Council. Um, we met at noon on Saturday, on, on Wednesdays. Um, when I was the president, I changed that to evenings on Wednesdays. It changed back as soon as I became, I left, left the presidency of the board, back to noon on Wednesdays. Noon on Wednesdays is not a great time for, uh, you know, city councilors are part-time. Um, none paid my first six years as a city councilor. Um, and uh, I left my job to come and, uh, and serve as a Eugene city councilor. I, I liked the work, um, the, uh, but the fact is uh, it's just not convenient to attend public meetings. You know, uh, we also met uh, the second and fourth Wednesday, uh, Monday evenings of the month. Um, and uh, typically we met the first, second, third, and fourth Monday evenings of the month. Once again, uh, that rules out people who have family at home, perhaps, you know, kids just got home from school, you got to feed dinner, you got to get ready, you got to mow the lawn, whatever it may be that you do. So whenever we have meetings, it's going to be inconvenient for some people. Heck, it's inconvenient for me. The Eugene City Council was extremely inconvenient for me, but I served and I enjoyed it. And, uh, and I uh, put in 10 years after I'd been on the council for six years, I voted against the $1,000 stipend that city councilors received. Um, but uh, 
that they do get a little bit of pay for the time that they spend. Really, it's not convenient to attend public meetings. That's why we tape it, we broadcast it, and it replays over and over again on the television. You can also go online to listen to the meetings. So I apologize, um, but if we were to say, well, let's have these meetings on such and such a time, then we'd have a different group of people saying, well, why don't you do it back the way you used to have it? So what I'd like to offer is any time anyone wants to call me and meet after hours or any, any particular time, I think, uh, you know, David, if you're still in the audience, you and I had a chance to meet you in a group uh, met in my office. Um, uh, and I'm not the only one. I'm, I'm not saying I'm, I'm different. Anybody else sitting up here, we'll all do it for you. Uh, so if it's more convenient to bring a group into my office or for me to address you in your place, um, then, uh, then I'm, I'm happy to do that. Will we always agree? Certainly not. Um, will we always uh, find happiness? Likely not. But will we always have a good conversation? I hope so. So please. Uh, as far as addressing your county commissioners, um, we are, we are full-time, unlike Eugene City Councilors. Uh, unlike when I was in the state legislature, you know, got paid about 1200 bucks a month there. That's not a full-time job. Um, so we are full-time, and we are available basically 24-7. In fact, the county, the charter says that uh, the county commission will be full-time, doesn't allow us to do any other work. This is our work. So come and see us. Um, and we can talk more in depth. Um, I, uh, the, the, my comments have always been that it's difficult to have a conversation back and forth in this environment. It's far more easy, as anyone who's been in my office understands, or anyone who's been in anybody's office understands, to have a meaningful conversation, disagreeing, agreeing, whatever it may be, inside the office, face to face. Please take advantage of that, and there are five of us. Um, it's more difficult for a city council because they mostly do have jobs, but uh, this is our job. Oh, one more thing, by the way. Um, Andrew, I told you this earlier. I took a test to become a United citizen, I, a United States citizen. Um, I, anybody else in the room? No, I won't ask for hand raising. Mr. Sorensen. Hey, thanks so much. Um, well, as far as um, the dominant uh, public comment this morning, I do uh, think that it's good that the board indicated a willingness to have a work session about uh, putting measures on the ballot. And although uh, uh, former Commissioner Rust uh, left, I thought the idea of a advisory vote was a contribution to the overall discussion. Um, I think that um, the uh, timeliness of it does worry me. In other words, p part of an, an election's fairness has to do with the preparation for the election. So in the case of, uh, let's say, the legislative election that's going on in 2018, uh, the calendar for that was set, I think, about two years ago in terms of what is the first day that candidates can file for the Oregon legislature. That's in September. Uh, what's the last day that they can file? That's in March. Uh, when are the ballots sent out? That's in April. When is the election held? That's in May for the primary election. So, so the, the fairness of the election isn't just that we're having an election. Uh, in fact, in some uh, parliamentary democracies, uh, they will have the election called by the majority party to, in fact, benefit them, to have the election in such a short time that only they knew that the election was going to be held. So part of the issue I think that we should discuss is, well, how fair is an election if, if the election's called only, you know, a month or two months before the election? How fair is that? Does that give people uh, time to prepare and have a well-run campaign uh, in an election? And so that does concern me. But I, I will say that the idea that we have uh, a statutory uh, initiative that can be put in front of the voters is something that's within the power of the of the commissioners and really should be the subject of a you know a well presented work session. And since we have advocates for the uh, for the measure, including them in the work session, it seems to me to be a way to show. Well, again, we're not committing individually to vote for the measure uh, if, even if we put it on the ballot. We're committing to giving the public the right to vote on it. So anyway, I'm glad that 
uh, we're keeping the focus on the work session and make sure we get it done so that the election itself is fair. Commissioner Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There was some question about uh, my position on the work session. Um, <clears throat> at the last meeting, there were, was a request for head nods, which requires three head nods, and it gets placed uh, um, before us. I also nodded my head in the affirmative. So for those who may have been uh, misled, that I was somehow opposed uh, to that work session, that is not correct. Um, I'd also like to state, because uh, Commissioner Farr kind of swerved into uh, the topic a little bit, Commissioner Lycan and I served our communities as mayors. I spent 16 years in public service in the city of Cottage Grove, all of it. All 16 years was uncompensated, period. Not a nickel, not a dime. I ran a small business. I was sole proprietor and I was the only guy working for me. When I took the 20 hours a week to do that job, my business was closed. So I do sympathize with a number of folks here that um, have missed work or can't be here because of work, I get that. But I just wanted you to know, and it probably doesn't matter to, to most of you, but I just wanted you to know the public service does come with a heavy burden and a heavy price, and there, there are some people that uh, volunteer their time because they believe in their community and the people in that community and uh, care, care very deeply why else would anybody spend 20 or more hours a week for 16 years being involved in a non-compensated position? And not unlike what uh, has occurred here for the last uh, three public meetings, where there are a lot of people that uh, have very, very strong feelings on a particular issue. Um, I'm no stranger to this. Uh, as mayor in Cottage Grove, we had numerous issues that were of deep concern to uh, a large number of people in those communities, and we worked through those problems. We addressed those problems. We came to uh, outcomes that were were fair and in the majority. So, with that, I just I thank you for your time for listening to me. But I wanted to set the record straight that uh, there are folks up here who uh, gave a great deal of their life and time in public service without compensation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Lycan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm going to keep this short. I've been battling the crud pretty bad. And so, Brenda, I hope you got my email. Okay, thank you. And I apologize, but the last two weeks have not been a lot of fun. So, and Mr. Frost, great to put a face to your voice. So, thank you for coming here today. And um, uh, I appreciate uh, our conversation on the phone. And thanks for coming here and testifying as well and taking the time to do that. I appreciate it. To everyone else, thank you for coming here this morning. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, it's taken everything I have to be here. Um, <clears throat> but um, I'm here and uh, trying to do our work. And uh, But thank you for your, your testimony. And, Brenda, I'll get back to you. Um, let, let me let this clear up a little bit, and I'll, and I'll get back to you. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to thank everybody for coming in to testify. This now makes over five hours of public testimony related to these two initiatives uh, that the Board of Commissioners has witnessed. And by the way, I did go back and watch every minute of testimony from the December 19th meeting where I was out celebrating my 60th birthday and taking my first vacation in over a year and a half. So. One of the things I'd like to address is a few things that, that came up and then, then the idea of, of what we're doing today. And, and, I, and I let some of the folks know that are involved in the, in the SPRAY initiative about this, um, that today we are going to have a discussion when we get to adjustments to future agenda items for the board. The agenda team did not feel comfortable on its own setting the work session because there were so many options as to timing. We wanted to have an open discussion 
amongst the five commissioners to pick a date for that work session. So that will come later under our agenda, to future agenda items. It's item 8B in our agenda. We've already been past adjustments to the agenda. We have staff that are kind of waiting in the wings, so to speak, for us to get to their agenda items. I feel at this time, changing our agenda is going to you know, cause a lot of issues for staff. And, and in fact, I see some of them waiting in the audience right now for their agenda items to come up and get taken care of. Um, unfortunately, staff sitting around means they're not doing other work for the county and, and it's a resource issue. So I wanna try and <clears throat> be respectful of our staff when we've scheduled something, publicized the agenda, and we didn't make a change up front to try and keep with the agenda we have publicized. The other couple items I just want to address real quick um, was, you know, the, the references to the, uh, in fact, Mr. Overton's reference to ORS 30, uh, 285 about us being able to be indemnified. Well, he didn't read the second portion of that, which basically says we're absolutely not indemnified if we act outside of our authority. You know, and, and that's, and, and the issue with that is particularly if we knowingly act outside of our authority. And, and that's what we're going to have to discuss about us actually referring something. Now, there was some discussion about, you know, if it's, you know, if it's an ordinance, it gets past the separate vote and all that stuff, and state preemption and everything else. That's true if it's a citizen-initiated petition to put on a ballot. If the, if the folks want to, you know, change from a, a charter amendment to an ordinance and then collect signatures and place it on the ballot, none of those pre-ballot tests, separate vote, or whether it violates the state constitution or, or prior preempted state laws, none of that would apply. The issue becomes when we are taking action as a board to refer it, whether or not we have any legal liability or not, because we know we're aware of the state preemption law and we would knowingly possibly be violating that, which would place us in personal liability. And it's an uncomfortable place to be, which there's been commissioners not too long ago that were in that place of being accused of knowingly having violated state law and possibly being personally responsible for legal cost in a lawsuit. You know, so it's not something that's a stranger to this board. So um, it, it's something we don't take lightly, and it's, and it's part of what we'll address in that work session is getting, you know, the time to, to gather the data, to look at the court cases behind those laws, and to give us legal um, advice as to whether or not we can take that action to refer an ordinance. So that's what we're looking at doing later under 8 B is to actually schedule that work session. We're not holding a work session today. I think there was some misunderstanding about that in some of the testimony. All we're going to do is have a discussion as a board about when we want to set that work session. And, you know, one of the things I've noticed in the testimony over the past three sessions is it's changed some. You know, the first session was all about how we ought to be placing the initiative, the arrow spray initiative on the ballot. Uh, and, and somehow or another against the judge's orders. And I think people have figured out that we don't really have the ability to do that and we can't supersede the, the, the presiding judge of the local circuit court. Um, and then, so the next session, the, it changed to, we'd like you to place an ordinance on the November ballot, which is a, com a completely kind of different request. And we all gave our head nods and said, you know, we'll hold a work session about that. Now you're asking for something for next November's ballot, the deadlines for those ballots and all don't occur till August and September. So we've got a good piece of time to gather that good legal data and try and figure out what we can do um, and, and move forward with that. I understand from the petitioners, you would rather have the charter amendment move forward. You know, if, if it was up to you, you'd rather see that charter amendment placed on the ballot uh, in May and we won't know those results till after the February 4th hearing with, with the judge on the appeals, February 2nd, sorry, I thought it was 4th, sorry, I'm mixing up my dates. February 2nd hearing with Judge Rasmussen, there'll be possible appeals of that. That case, you know, hope, you know, that may actually end up placing it on the ballot, may miss the May ballot, may end up on the November general ballot, but kind of, I know from what you all really want, that's 
the primary desire, to have an actual charter amendment that couldn't be changed by the board, a future board or something like that. Secondary to that, you're asking us to look at placing an ordinance on the ballot. So that, and that's something we were, we all agreed to hold a work session on. So I think we have listened to the testimony. You know, so some of the, some of the discussion about, you know, whether we're violating democracy or listening to the people, I think we're, we've, we've heard and we're planning to schedule that work session. We're actually going to set a date later today. So hopefully I, uh, you know, that kind of answers some questions for folks and kind of gives you a, a, where the board's going with this. There's a separate process that's happening in the courts out there on the charter amendments, and and we'll see how that that falls out. But we we have yeah you know, we will later today schedule that work session, as we have a discussion here about timing um, and, and when it should take place, and uh, you know I'm sure you guys can watch if you can't stay all the way through our other items that are scheduled that we have staff here for. Um, we are on the internet or on local um, <clears throat> community access TV. And, and, you know, if you don't see it live, you can watch it back, not live later on. And, and you can actually get to various points in our agenda. You don't have to watch the whole meeting from the beginning. You can actually click on agenda item 8B and the video will skip down to that point in, in the, so easy, easy to actually watch and hear what's said by each commissioner. So. And again, we are ultimately really available to the people. I make myself available in multiple ways, whether it's, you know, personal meetings, telephone, email, Facebook Messenger, Twitter, you can get a hold of me. So please uh, don't feel like we're not available to you. And, and I hope that um, you all feel like we, we're paying attention and listening. We've had multiple other things come to us from citizens that I think we've paid attention, listened, and changed things. Um, you know, just you know, looking back at the recent, you know, last year we we made a we adopted some lane manual changes around uh, immigration and issues of immigration enforcement that were initiated by people coming and talking to us here in public comment, not by the board. So. We do listen, we do take action based on citizen input. So thank you for coming today. Uh, Commissioner Flower. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the, um, the delineation that you just laid out. You know, you may notice that I take notes. I write down your quotes with quotation marks around them, and sometimes I repeat them. When I was a chair, and pr prior to that as a vice chair, I didn't have a chance to do that, but now I get more opportunity, and I've written down some quotes, um, which I'll say in just a second, but first, I hope you stay uh, past the consent calendar and into the item eight on our calendar, which is, um, I'll tell you what it is, uh, a report back to the board on the potential impacts of federal tax reform on the taxpayers of Lane County and Lane County government. Anybody interested in that? I guess this is going to be a really riveting discussion. I see people from our uh, finance uh, division, people from the budget is here, people from our uh, federally qualified health centers are here. You know, we, we uh, uh, 30,000 or so people in Lane County count on Lane County for their primary care in our federally qualified health centers. We'll be talking about that. Um, it's going to be really interesting. If you don't get to, if you don't have an opportunity to see it, please watch it later because this is going to be a great discussion about how the Federal Tax Reform Act is going to affect you and going to affect the people of Lane County. Uh, back to my quotes. Um, I've got one quote here. Um, let me see if I can find it. Yeah, here it is. Um, Shame on you, county commissioners, shame on you. I'm not ashamed of my work. Oh my gosh, I'm not ashamed of my work. I'm proud of the work that we do. I'm proud of the 30,000 people we serve in our federally qualified health centers. I'm proud of the people who were homeless who aren't homeless. I'm proud of the people who uh, have nutrition that didn't have nutrition. I'm proud of my work. Uh, and I'm ashamed that somebody would, uh, would call for me to be ashamed of my work. My gosh, that really bothers me. The other quote is um, uh, from Kevin Matthews' friend Joe in Springfield. Um, a good bureaucrat helps people to get what they need. Absolutely. Check out our work. Thank you. Any other remonstrance? Then we'll move on in the agenda. Um, is there any emergency business today? No. Then we'll move on to the consent calendar. And these are items that are routine uh, and 
are considered routine by the board and they are passed in a single motion uh, without any discussion of, of the items. But you can go online and hit view material uh, on the agenda to, to get the background on each one if you're interested. Uh, if there were items that the board wanted to have pulled from this, they would have pulled them under adjustments to the agenda. So do I have a motion on today's consent calendar? Commissioner Lykin. Mr. Chair, move approval of the consent, consent calendar. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The consent calendar passes unanimously. So moving on, we're to item six, county council announcements. And I don't believe, it doesn't look like anyone from county council's here, so I don't think we have any announcements, but we do have executive session today, which will happen in front of item 10 on human resources. So that brings us down to county administration announcements. Mr. Mokohyski. I'm happy to hold, Mr. Chair, and we can get through the next item, and then um, as that clears up, we can I'll share a couple things with you. Great. And if, oh, good. They're letting the door close. <laughs> We can get that door closed and we'll get so we can hear you guys. <clears throat> can we get the door closed, please? There we go. Thank you. So we have a report on the federal tax reform and we have um, Christine Moody, Robert Tintle, and Ron Jelm. Ron Jelm, sorry. Uh, sure, sure, hold on a sec. Go ahead. Yeah. So thank you, Mr. Chair. And real quickly, um, I, we had received some interest, some be, prior to the vote had been re, uh, of Congress, we had been receiving information from NACO. And I had forwarded that information on to, um, in particular, Robert and Christine and, and, and uh, Commissioner Farr as we serve on the Finance and Audit Committee meeting and, and we got, we received somewhat of an update at the finance and audit, but now that the law has been passed, um, it seemed very appropriate to make sure that this was presented before the entire board. So I really want to say thank you to staff for working on this. And our na national association, we should be very grateful. They're highly engaged in this issue and they were bringing information significantly back to commissioners and when I saw that, that's why I thought it was very important that we get it to our, our uh, the brains of the operation and let them, of course, present to the board just to kind of get an idea, not only how it affects Lane County, our operations, but what could happen out there with the citizens, both positive and negative. And so thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to make these first comments. Thank you. So I'll let you guys take it away with your presentation, but I'm sure that the question and answer is probably going to be the big part of this. So go ahead. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you for inviting us and recommending that we come and talk about this topic. It, hopefully it is very riveting for everybody and engaging in a great conversation. Yes, as you mentioned, joined by Christine Moody, Budget and Planning Manager, Ron Jelm for Health and Human Services, and myself, Robert Tintel from Financial Services. So today we are going to talk about the impacts to Lane County government, the impacts on taxpayers, and also the businesses in Lane County. As mentioned, we do rely on the great connections with our associations, our professional networks for information, and they're advocates on our behalf. They provide information for us as well, and we rely on them and work with all of our professional organizations as here, mentioned here, National Association of Counties, Municipal Debt Advisory Commission, Government Finance Officers Association, OACTFO. Um, we also have information from the Oregon Economic Forecast that we'll mention, and we get information from the United States Chamber of Commerce. So just to be clear, we are not tax professionals up here. We are, um, we are not fully familiar with all the impacts from the tax reform because there are many, many provisions, but we are here to talk about some of the, some of the highlights um, as noted by our professional organizations and that we became aware of as well to help inform the discussion as today. So first we'll talk about the impacts on Lane County. 
When, as you know, there were many, there were back and forth on will, will this pass, will this be included, will it not be included, is this going to be eliminated? So there are many provisions in the various versions of the tax reform. Um, so we'll talk about a few that are going to be maintained. So the tax exempt status on municipal bonds, that is maintained in the current legislation. There was concern that it wouldn't be, but it is. And this is good, you know. I don't know that we have plans for professional sports stadiums <laughs> here in Lane County, but um, interest earned on municipal bonds is still tax exempt, which is a great thing here. Private activity bonds, same thing. Maintain the tax exempt status for private activity bonds and the interest earned, meaning the interest earned is tax exempt. And that's another useful tool that organizations, governments have, and that is maintained as well. Unrelated business income tax, there was talk with this one if it was going to be eliminated, but however, uh, it is also maintained so that the exemptions, so that certain state and local tax exempt entities are not subject to this tax because related to pension plans, that was a concern there. But it's maintained, uh, there was no change there as well. And these are all good things of the items that were maintained. New market tax credits. Another one that was maintained, that was up in the air, back and forth at different times as well. This allows qualifying investors that they can claim credit for developments in qualified community entities when they meet the thresholds defined by law. And a lot of this is related to affordable housing. And so the new, new market tax credits is maintained. One thing that is added to the tax reform bill, and this is a new item for us. This is called the Opportunity Zones, and it's also a tool used for community development. It's in addition to the new market tax credit, and it works a little bit differently, but but it's still, it's in addition to. So there were a few things added in the tax reform bill that we're just now becoming aware of. So this, this includes tax incentives to the purpose is to unlock investor capital to fund businesses, again, in underserved communities. And they can defer this tax, the, the tax on gains, up to nine years. But there's a few things that have to happen first for this to actually be implemented. The governor must designate opportunity zones within the state. And then the Treasury Department also still has to develop rules to determine how these qualified opportunity funds get certified. So there's some things that need to happen before this tool can be used, but it is another, as you refer to, a tool in the tool chest to help with that. So we don't know the exact impact yet and work has to be done, but it's, an, it's a tool that's in there available for us. As you know, uh, the tax reform bill also included a repeal of the Affordable Care Act of the individual mandate. And we, we can address questions with that later as well. There are some items that have a potential for a negative impact to the county. Um, one of them is, the first one is eliminates the tax exempt status of, of advance refundings. As you know, in May of this past year, 2017, we did an advance refunding where we saved the taxpayers of Lane County over $3 million over the life of the payments just by refinancing our bonds. And we had a great discussion on that. One thing with the tax reform bill, you, the tax, the advance refunding bonds are no longer tax exempt. You can still do advance refundings, however, it's not tax exempt, which means you would pay a higher interest rate, which means the savings wouldn't be as great and or the benefit of, of doing an advance refunding may not be there. You may not have the net present value savings that's needed in order to do an advance refunding, but they're still available to governments just not tax exempt. The county is still able to do current refundings, which is a current refinance when bonds are callable, you can refinance at any point in time. And again, you do the financial analysis to make sure that both of those are, are good decisions. The tax reform bill also includes, it maintains the so-called term, so term Cadillac tax. And what this is, it's a provision on the Affordable Care Act, uh, which eventually it will place a 40% tax on employee-sponsored health plans. Sorry, Christine, did you have a comment on that? 
Yeah, I'll yeah, jump in just a little bit on that one. So the board may remember um, that when this t uh, tax was first mentioned, we had done some analysis internally about whether the county would be hit with it. Our copay plan is anticipated to be hit with it. We currently have about 65% of our employees enrolled in that plan. So now there's still some, if they delay it, if our um, cost of that plan grows a little bit slower, that might blunt some of the impact. Um, but it is an excise tax on the employer of 40%, anything above. So this one definitely has been something that we've been watching um, for a couple years now and continue to watch. And be before we leave this one, the effective date on that is 2020 or? Well, I, I was just sharing, Mr. Chair, that we actually have an update on that. Um, things have moved rather quickly in the last day when Congress voted yesterday uh, to reopen the government. Part of that, um, uh, that continuing resolution is, we understand it includes a two-year delay of the Cadillac tax, so that Cadillac tax would actually be implemented in 2022. Huh. It was scheduled for 2020. It was, it's been pushed out. I think the original date was 2018. They pushed out to 2020, and then in the continued resolution, as we understand, again, that was approved yesterday to get pushed out to 2022. Okay. So some good news yeah. for the moment. A couple more years to watch. Time to prepare. Yeah. Breaking news. Here we go. Breaking news. <laughs> and now Christine will talk about the tax projection, revenue projections from the state of Oregon as well. So the state of Oregon, I looked to see if they had put out anything really recent. I was not able to find something, but they, of course, were talking about it quite a bit in December while everything was going through Congress. Um, the December Oregon economic forecast talked about it, and then there have been comments made. So one thing that might not... Um, be something that people would think of is that when federal taxes go down, state revenue will go up in those income tax states. And that's because we all start our Oregon tax return with that federal adjusted number. And so when that um, number goes up, then the state will receive more money. So Oregon, um, one of our economists had predicted that we might see as much as 200 million increase in the first year. Um, so it's going to depend on whether the state decides, whether the legislature decides to stay connected to all of the federal <clears throat> rules, which we are, but they can uncouple some of those. Um, so back in the 80s, the last mid-80s, late um, early 90s, they had made um, some federal tax cuts, and Oregon saw a 20% increase in their personal income tax revenue the next year. Um, at that time, they had even done a few things, like lowering the tax rate, changing the standard deduction. So they could do some of that here. We'll watch them in February. Um, but they'll be also working on the forecast and trying to figure out all of these impacts at the same time. Um, so a few things to highlight on the um, personal income tax um, is where they're going to see the most positive growth in the state revenue. On the corporate, they'll see some negative, but they think it will ba be balanced out enough. And then, of course, in Oregon, there is the um, possibility that the kicker will kick. So they're saying if all things stayed relatively equal, um, in December forecast, they were predicting that the kicker would likely kick. Um, so then, of course, revenue is going back to taxpayers. Um, so that impact on taxpayers is still to be determined if they're going to pay less to feds but more to state. Um, what that net um, will be will be something we'll have to watch for. A clarifying question, Mr. Chair. From sure, Commissioner Fox. Uh, Ms. Moody, in 2003, when I was in the legislature, I was on the um, House Revenue Committee, where <laughs> all revenue begins in, in Oregon. Um, and at that time, we disconnected from the federal um, tax. The state, we had the state disconnect. That, that went through the House and Senate. So is that something that the legislature does from time to time, reconnect, disconnect, reconnect, disconnect, based upon the whim of the legislature? That's my so understanding speak? and what was mentioned in the forecast. And it seemed pretty whimsical from... to me at the time. Yeah, right. Okay. So they try and do the analysis of what's going to benefit mm -hmm. uh, what's them or benefit? taxpayers or where or they Or the political to. party that's in control at the time. Okay, very good. Mr. Lichen. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I just recently, I, and I wish I could remember who it was from, but I just recently saw an analysis based on what you're talking about 
and they were talking in terms of $1.4 billion. So they've updated. Yeah, so, and I believe that was within the last week, maybe two weeks, okay. something of that sort. And I wish I could remember where the analysis was from, but I think it would, the Oregonian was reporting it is, is where I saw that. And so, uh, <clears throat> uh, again, it's always good to find out who prepared the analysis, because right now I, do, I, I, don't, I don't recall. I just saw that number, and I said, wow. So it'd be interesting to hear hear more about that in, in the future. But thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome. Go ahead. <clears throat> so next we'll move into some of the impacts to taxpayers of Lane County. And of course, what's a good discussion on this without a good disclaimer? Um, again, we do advise and recommend that each individual speak to their tax advisor or the Internal Revenue Service if they have specific questions on their own unique circumstance, because everyone's situation will be unique. Uh, one of the highlights of the tax reform is, well, it does retain the seven brackets, but most of the brackets are lower. So you'll notice here, um, these are the rates effective for unmarried individuals, married, joint returns, and or head of households. You can see the rate is from 10% to 37, and it, it, it's different than what it was. And I'll show you here on the next slide. For example, for, here's for married individuals filing jointly. The old rate is on the left side, and the new brackets are on the left side, so you can see 10% is the base rate, the highest decreased from 39.6 down to 37%, and the brackets are slightly different there. So depending on what your, the wage is for an individual taxpayer, the percentage of tax will be different. Their tax rate will now be likely be different. A couple of changes with the personal exemption and the standard deduction within the tax reform bill the personal exemption was eliminated through 2025, and these are temporary eliminations. And it was originally set to be uh, $4,150 in 2018, but because of the tax reform, it has been eliminated. But along with that, the standard deduction has been increased through 2025, and the deduction now for singles is $12,000, married filing jointly is $24,000 now, and head of household $18,000. That's, that's an increase over the prior amounts. As you may know, there was a lot of discussion about SALT, state and local taxes, and whether that was gonna be totally eliminated, included, or what, where it ended up, it's limited currently anyway, right? Limited to $10,000 for a combination of property taxes and either income taxes or sales taxes. Uh, previously, as you know, filers could deduct all state and local property tax as well as either their income or sales tax as well. So this was uh, a limit there of $10,000. Other changes? The child tax credit increased from $1,000 to $2,000 for those eligible for that. Another change was in the mortgage interest deduction because there was a lot of, again, discussion back and forth. Is it eliminated? Is it included? Is it not? Previously, it was a million dollars. The interest paid on acquisition of a home up to a million dollars. Now you can deduct the interest paid on the acquisition of up to $750,000 in value. Uh, but there's no deduction for home equity loans or if you have a line of credit that's tied with that. Previously, that was allowed. Briefly, we'll move into the impacts on businesses in Lane County. Ms. Moody will talk about that. And again, we do recommend that businesses consult with their tax advisor or the IRS for specific questions unique to their situation. And I'll just start out by saying this is where I start to wade into areas that I, it just doesn't impact my daily government budgeting, but um, we will share with you um, what has changed and then a little bit maybe more on what uh, Oregon was saying about these changes. So changes to the corporate tax, uh, corporate tax rate re being reduced from 35% down to 21%. 
um, the statement that that's uh, in alignment with other countries. Um, it also does not have a sunset date. You heard Robert mention a couple of the other provisions that do have sunset dates. This one does not. Um, this is one area where Oregon said um, that this would be an indirect impact on the state budget and that it was uncertain. Um, that's been back when it was looking at a 20%, so I would assume that um, that's still something that they're working on determining. Um, for small businesses, next slide. 20% uh, of pass-through income will be excluded from taxation uh, depending on the type of business and the uh, IRS formula. Um, there's some income numbers there for you based on married or single filers. Um, that also, that um, before when they were talking about a 25% rate cap on the pass-through income, they were saying that that would be a minimal impact on Oregon's uh, revenue. Um, so any regular salary is subject to different rules. 20% deduction is limited to 50% of business payroll. This one does have a sunset date of 2025. One other comment I'd like to make before we get to your questions and comments as well. Back to the individual is a lot of you have heard uh, people should start noticing in their February paychecks the new tax tables. Just so you know, the process with that is the IRS released the tax tables in January and the, the new tax tables usually go to the software companies to make changes in their system and then it gets down to the employers. So for us specifically here at Lane County, our uh, dedicated payroll professionals that we have working, they do, they are working on updating the tax tables and running through the process this week. So for our organization, um, our employees should notice within their on their February 2nd paycheck the effects of the new tax rate tables being implemented. The way the IRS designed the tax tables is based on your current withholdings, it should transfer over to the new tax rates. So individuals aren't required to issue a new, uh, submit a new W-4. It works with your current withholdings. Again, however, each individual situation is unique, and so you'd want to, you know, check your own situation based there. However, but like I said, we should be implementing that within February 2nd for Lane County. Mr. Chair, a clarifying question on that? Go ahead. And, and that would be uh, not just Lane County I'm, as an employer, but other employers are receiving it on the same schedule. The same schedule, but their implementation may be different, be different depending yeah. on their size, their resources, what payroll service they use. Nice. So, but the information is now out there. It's just getting the process to get it implemented. So the timing may be different for each organization. So uh, for, for an organization we're familiar with, us, Lane County. Correct. Any Lane County employee could <clears throat> compare their 1st of January paycheck to their 1st of February paycheck straight across and see what the difference is to them personally. If they had not received um, a Some merit increase, pay right. increase, right. right. If they were the same rate of pay for those two pay periods. Yes. Right, and all other things considered equal, right. correct. Right. Yeah, so yeah, for instance, if their uh, they're, uh, pre-tax um, medical, whatever program they use, if that changed. Okay, very good. That should be fairly simple for somebody to calculate. So. It could be. Yeah. Could be. It'll be easy for you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> and that is the end of our formal presentation, so we'd be happy to have any further discussion or answer any questions we can for you. And again, Ron is here if you have specific questions. Mr. Sorensen, I know you asked for this agenda. Yeah, item. thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the, uh, the presentation here. It's very helpful to understand um, more about this. I'm sure we'll learn more as the... Uh, Internal Revenue Service issues their guidance to to taxpayers. Um, now, if there was such a thing as an average Lane County federal taxpayer or an average Lane County uh, corporation, uh, or maybe a couple <laughs> average people, um, would it, would it be possible for you to show in terms of uh, different levels of business in the corporate or in the uh, or in the personal, what the net effect is if the state um, tax, without change by the legislature, is going up and the federal tax is going down. This is in general. Um, can you give us some idea of what? the impact is on the public. 
I think that's where you start to wade in the tax professional piece that we might not be as comfortable. There's so many nuances. Um, that's why we kind of stuck with these are the deductions. I'm not aware of, I mean, we know median income um, mm -hmm. uh, for a household. Yeah. We might know for an individual, but we don't know what their other situation is. So yeah. um, that's, a, yeah, unless Robert. Because if they were, comment, just to take an example, if they were uh, contributors to charity and they get that big, uh, 24,000 married taxpayers finally jointly get that $24,000 um, I believe the term is standard deduction standard deduction they may receive a a lower tax benefit and have to pay higher taxes if they were contributing more than that amount of money but if they weren't then they're going to have their federal taxes lowered so all kinds of pieces come yeah. into it, right? Is there any way to know, has anybody, any of those associations, have they put out what the effect is on, quote, the average Oregon taxpayer who's oh. paying both federal, state, and local taxes? I haven't seen anything from any of the organizations. Of course, they're more national level and they're more um, government focused uh -huh. rather than individual focused. But I would expect the place that we probably would see that is from Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, uh, potentially in the March economic forecast, they might do some forecasting about they would have that data okay. from the uh, state tax side and be able to talk about what it right. looks like. So um, as soon as we see more information on that, we could definitely come back now assuming the federal government continues its borrowing there will there be effects on the on the revenue side in other words on what we get from the federal government what lane county specifically yeah. gets yeah it depends on the source of that revenue um and there i would have probably you're not you're not saying as right. a result of this preparation you're not saying we need to reduce the amount of federal revenue for purposes of our proposed budget that will be adopted sometime between now and end of june correct you're not you're not saying oh the, the revenue is dropping so much at the federal level that we're going to have to change what right we're doing. in the general fund i can tell you that for sure yeah there's no i'm not making any adjustments for anything mm -hmm. that this okay. this law has changed i don't know if um h and hs ron's going to be more familiar with the clinics but no he's mm -hmm. saying they are not either so i have not had any department um call and warn us that they're going to see something from that either can you explain to um those of us that are you know interested in all this if if the taxes are dropped why it doesn't affect the federal dollars to Lane County. That, that seems a perplexing thing to me, that in, 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 in a family, if the revenue drops, the spending will either drop or there'll be more borrowing, okay? What, what do you think's the reason, because I, I was perplexed when I heard this, that, well, the impact of the federal tax bill uh, federal tax will not be felt by America's 20 some thousand local governments. <laughs> that seems odd to me. Why, why is that? Well, a lot, well, yeah, depends on the direct revenue, but you, you already mentioned that they can borrow. So the federal government has that unique situation where they're not balancing their budget the same way local governments are. So it's a different um, budget style so seeing whether there's any economic impacts whether uh, how fast income goes up all of those things will play into what the bottom line is in a few mm -hmm. years okay thank you mr far thank you for those questions commissioner Sorensen. you know what i've what i've been looking for is apples to apples and it's kind of hard to get apples to apples on this but i think uh, that you gave me a, an opportunity perhaps to look at an apples to apples with uh, any employee's paycheck uh, look at, you know, make certain that their um, deductions are the same. But my, my question, Ron, is for you. Um, are you, do you have a, uh, do you have a prepared statement or 
Are you going to say anything, or uh, shall I ask my question? <laughs> uh, uh, no, I just uh, uh, came primarily uh, with respect to the impact of the change of the individual mandate in the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. um, we really are projecting a de minimis I impact of, their, of that uh, because uh, fewer than 4% uh, of our patients and even less than that of our activity, uh, patient visits mm -hmm. in the community health centers are, are covered by individuals with commercial insurance. Now, we have no way of knowing how many of those 4% are covered by commercial insurance through an employer as opposed to an individual uh, purchase. Uh, but given that it's 4% you know, of our uh, patient uh, volume, you know, even if you were to say it's half, and I don't expect that it is anywhere close to that, you know, that would be a potential impact if all of them uh, discontinued coverage of maybe less than 2% uh, or 1% of our patient volume that would go from um, a paid commercial insurance <clears throat> to uninsured. That simple statement covers most of my question. Um, and uh, other than apples to apples, my concern was the people that, who rely on Lane County for fill in the blank health care uh, in this case. Um, and my number earlier that I stated, 30,000 people approximately rely on us for, for uh, primary care. But far beyond primary care, we have behavioral health that occurs in our federally qualified health centers. We have um, uh, ongoing health maintenance that occurs and the inter integration of the two, which we are pretty unique uh, as far as the way we address that. So it sounds as though your word was de minimis as far as the effect on the people who seek services at our federally qualified health centers. Yes. Now, the next question, which you may not be uh, prepared to answer, is uh, what about the other people? What about the other Lane County residents who do have the Oregon Health, well, let's say the Oregon Health Plan. How, how's the Oregon Health Plan affected? Well, Oregon Health Plan uh, really is impacted, and I encourage everyone to vote uh, today. Um, mm -hmm. uh, measure 101 uh, has a potential impact, as we uh, have talked in earlier uh, meetings, mm -hmm. um, uh, has a potential impact of uh, reducing uh, funding, and that would have a profound impact. About 80 percent of our activity is related to uh, Medicaid uh, mm -hmm. beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. uh, so there really are a couple of components uh, that we're keeping a close eye on. Uh, Measure 101 and the Medicaid funding here at the state level. Uh, the other which you haven't asked about, we talked again uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, is the ongoing uh, funding for federally qualified health centers in terms of uh, the federal funding and the grant funding. About 10 percent of our revenue is uh, associated with the grant funds uh, from uh, CMS uh, uh, as a federally qualified health center. Um, we had hoped uh, that that funding uh, might be included in the continuing resolution that was passed. Uh, it was not. Um, uh, uh, both of our senators and Representative DeFazio continue to be strong champions for community health centers, and it really has had broad bipartisan support. I hope uh, that the CHIP funding, which you may uh, know was included in the uh, CR uh, for six years, I hope that that is a boilerplate for the funding for community health centers because like the CHIP funding, folks on both sides of the aisle for many years have expressed support for that and continue to express support for funding for community health centers. About one in four uh, individuals in the country who are covered by Medicaid receive their services through community health centers, through federally qualified health centers. So you can see the profound impact uh, that uh, FQHCs have across the nation, and so I continue to be hopeful. Um, our budget would not be impacted uh, until actually June 1st, mm -hmm. um, so this could go for a while before, before it would negatively impact us. Thank you. Uh, once again, you're getting close to answering the questions that I would ask. Um, the uh, you know one of the, one of the drives last week, and I spent the week in Washington D.C. and we talked about the disassociation from CHIP with CHC, and we talked about that with all of our legislative uh, um, continue well not everyone but um, but the people represented in in Washington D.C. and everybody agrees that CHCs need to be uh, continue to be funded. Um, so we'll see what mechanism occurs to make that happen. The uh, the other question that I have is that Oregon has a uh, we have 16. Uh, coordinated care organizations in Oregon. We have one here in Lane County. Many of those people, uh, many of the people who uh, receive services through the CCOs um, do have private uh, med doctors. Um, uh, I, I think I'm correct in that. Yes. So, um, so the people who don't get their primary care from 
our federally qualified health centers, which, by the way, for the world who's listening, originated here in Lane County through the work of Steve Manella and others. Um, so um, the people who don't receive their primary care through um, federally qualified health centers, um, how are they going to be affected? You know, again, it's it's hard to it's hard to predict. Um, we have a strong community coalition here in, in Lane County with uh, private practitioners who are really dedicated to uh, serving uh, the uninsured and the underinsured. Uh, uh, the CCO here has a long history of good cooperation uh, with private practitioners, um, uh, both in private practice as well as the larger practice groups. Um, and uh, they continue uh, to participate uh, in this program through uh, through the CCO through Trillium. So, in in no part, the answer there is we have to kind of watch and see. Um, we are optimistic, but we need to watch and see to see how many people uh, potentially are going to lose primary care, uh, or if any people are going to lose primary care based upon uh, the uh, the Tax Reform Act. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome, Commissioner Lykin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so just real briefly, Ron, I appreciate the, the update, and uh, especially regarding the mandate. I think that's, uh, that's interesting, and, and, um, <clears throat> but, uh, but it's good information for us to have as well, just in case we're stopped by constituents. We have that information available. And on the CR, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, so we, we do know that both Senator Wyden and Merkley are, are highly supportive of this, Congressman DeFazio, and so is Congressman Walden. And I just I, I bring that out because he is number five on the food chain as far as the uh, uh, ranking is concerned on the, on the majority party. And, and uh, I've had direct contact with him. And in a sense, uh, because CHIP now is, it's through. We're, we're good with that. Uh, his response to me was, you know, what this may do is, be, and yes, this is going to be three weeks before, you know, after the CR runs out on February 9th. But between now and then, because CHIP is done, it allow maybe some of that bipartisan work to really focus on the CHCs, because we're not the only. The CHCs are around the country. And so, uh, and our CHCs here, I, I got to tell you, I just, I just can't say enough on the success that we have here. And so... <clears throat> I appreciate you bringing that up because over the next three weeks, I think it's important for us just to continue to really engage in our delegation, just to let them know how important this is and what it does for our constituents here in Lane County. And uh, so um, any information that you hear from your folks back in D.C. that we haven't received yet, please feel free to make sure you share with our with our with the board so we can be on the be on the phone as well. And having direct conversations with our with our delegation, and so much appreciated on that. But that that was a good update. I was disappointed, but then also kind of understood that because Chip seemed to be the one that people were really focused on, and now uh, it allows that to maybe the focus come back around on the on the CHC. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Right on. So I. <clears throat> Just a couple quick notes. One, I just want to say thank you for the report and a lot of the questions from um, Commissioner Farr about the impacts of the, the individual mandate and, and those issues relative to the, the CHC and, the, and also the CCO were, were questions I was going to ask, so he kind of beat me to a few of those questions. So I appreciate that you kind of were prepared to answer those. Um, I'll be interested to, to find out what the Opportunity Zone works out to be and some more information on that and you know whether we can get the governor to designate some part of Lane County as an opportunity zone and, and help us out. But I wanted to sort of answer a question maybe that that, that Commissioner Sorensen asked somewhat and, and that was his question was, you know, if we make a tax cut, how is the revenue coming in the same? It's because you know there is the disconnect that they don't have to balance their budget. But the other thing is 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 the questions asked based on a static model of taxation and revenue and and the economy. And if there's an interrelationship between all those things that it's not a static model, that you have to model these things dynamically because if with the tax cut there will be an economic impact and actually change the growth of GDP, which will actually change the amount of tax revenue coming in. The question is, is how to correctly model that. Is it being correctly modeled? You know, is it over presumptuous? You know, and all, and that's that's where 
we get into a lot of discussion, but and and you know there are folks with PhDs in economics that have you know <laughs> written papers on on that dynamic modeling question and and whether or not it's right or not. But it it, it has proven in the past you know federal tax cuts do tend to stimulate the economy and generate additional revenues, even though it seems um, not easy to to. To put your head around, but it, it does even you know the t a cut in the uh, the base tax rates tends to generate additional tax revenue. Um, how far you can go with that, and, and where the break points are, and how 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 elastic, inelastic, and a whole whole bunch of other things, um, is a discussion for the folks over at the University of Oregon Economics Department, not me. <laughs> so, but that's and, and it really gets down to what's the federal budget that's passed. Designates the revenue to the county has almost it's a completely disconnected because they can pass imbalanced budgets from the actual revenue received. So it's really about you know our ability to lobby and and keep the federal art you know the the programs that serve our citizens funded at current level of service or and and also accounting for um, inflationary costs and everything and. One of those issues is the funding for that portion of the federally qualified health clinics, um, and, and I was I was really happy to hear that at least that three-week extension of uh, the continuing resolution had the six-year re-up of the, the the chip, and uh, that's one issue we won't have to follow. <laughs> yeah, that's check that one off the list. We know we're going to be continuing to get the same amount of, of support, you know, for the children of this county. Uh, relative to health care, and that, that's you know, the next piece is we got to get that the, the health clinic portion of the bill passed. Commissioner Sorensen. Yeah, um, one thing I wanted to um, uh, mention is that the idea that when I was a kid, the federal budget was on the years starting July 1, and then Congress changed that to October 1. So Last year for the federal government ended September 30th, and this year for the federal government began October 1. And we're now on our fourth time that Congress has um, voted on and the president signed a continuing resolution so that the federal government can operate. So the good news is federal government's operating. But lost in this is the issue of how difficult it is for local governments and the public to deal with this apparent inability to do something that Lane County's done for all the time I've been here and for many years prior to that, namely have an orderly process of a budget proposal hearings, uh, markup, decisions, and then votes by our budget committee and by our board of commissioners to accommodate uh, a balanced budget. Now, we're not going to try to hold the federal government to a balanced budget. <laughs> that seems impossible. But, and I don't really have an answer to this, but I think it is worth mentioning that all of these programs are run on essentially a temporary situation. And I think that it is a horrible thing. It's really a horrible thing. And I know you guys are doing the best you can to cope with this, but I just think it's worth pointing out that not having a budget because the two sides of Congress can't agree on a budget and the president hasn't been able to agree on a budget is it once again we're facing another shutdown in another what week and a half something like that so to me that's not a good way to run a railroad or a country where you're trying to you know they, they don't even have hearings on these budgets they don't have uh, I, I think there were like 10 or 12 uh, maybe 13 major appropriations bills coming from the 26 or so subcommittees in the House and Senate. And those folks really know those budgets well, and they tend to work together. So I'm not necessarily saying that people on those appropriation subcommittees aren't doing their job. I just think that the overall 
um, uh, inability to get along and come to an agreement in a timely fashion just seems to be going on and on and on. And I guess since I've heard the the arguments from both political parties as on each, which it depends on which continuing resolution you hear them talk about, but the arguments are used by the same, the same arguments are used by the same, uh, by the different political parties as to why we didn't get an agreement. And there was an, an article on the Hill, which is a uh, kind of website and newspaper that covers uh, the Congress, on uh, the emergence of a group of bipartisan senators that came together uh, in advance of this uh, last deadline, I think Sunday. And they met in Senator Collins' office and the, the Democratic senators and Republican senators met in her office as kind of a neutral ground, I guess, and 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 they're the ones that came up with this current uh, current budget compromise. But it is is worth noting that you know I mean we have a lot of constituents that are really mad about this, and uh, it's just a big waste of money. I think this one they're saying costs fifteen billion dollars. So it's a big waste of time and money. So any other questions about the uh, federal tax reform? I really appreciate your time and uh, Thank you. coming in and presenting on that because it's uh, important how that impacts us. So we skipped over um, county administration announcements. Do you want to cover that now, Steve? Be happy to. Maybe we can uh, spend a minute talking about what we're doing here at the local level to uh, be responsive to our residents and community and um, uh, provide uh, representation uh, for our community here. Uh, so quick update on elections. Um, voter turnout as of yesterday is 33%. That's 81,096 ballots returned. Uh, by comparison, uh, eight years ago, January 2010 election, we had 104,000 909 uh, at the same time, so significantly lower than uh, than the January election eight years ago. Drop boxes will close tonight at 8 p.m., so if you haven't, we're all wearing our I Voted stickers, so I voted, I know you all voted, and uh, but for anyone who hasn't had the opportunity uh, to cast your vote and return your ballot, uh, you still have an opportunity to do that for about a little less than nine, what is this, eight hours and ten, and. Uh, Eight hours and 50 minutes, right? So you have till 8 p.m. tonight. Uh, there are 20 drop box uh, locations in Lane County. Uh, any Oregon official ballot can be deposited at any official drop site. Uh, results will be posted at 8 p.m. or shortly thereafter, and then we'll have updates at 10 p.m. Um, and before we leave for the night, um, the election will be certified to the state no later than February 12th is 20 days after the election. And just another reminder, because this is typically, uh, uh, we have an issue with um, a handful of ballots, that your your voter ballots have to be received at an official Dropbox site by 8 p.m. If you come after 8 p.m., those Dropbox, uh, Dropboxes are locked, and you can't jam <laughs> the ballot in there and have it be counted. Um, so you have until 8 p.m. tonight after that. Um, you're out of luck. So that's it, and then I will also provide uh, an update next Tuesday on the final uh, returns. Uh, of course, we'll know tonight what the outcome of the election is. I want to just make another note, as I did last week, um, for those commissioners, I know Commissioner Bozovich, and I'm not sure if Commissioner Farr was able to be at the MLK. You were in Washington, D.C., I think. On different MLK, yeah. Different MLK event, yeah. Um, but Commissioner Bozovich, I know, was at the... Um, uh, NAACP event, as was I, and uh, Greg Rickoff, Devin Ashbridge. Um, uh, I saw Karen Gaffney and Carla Ayers and Alana Holmes were there. And uh, among recognizing a number of other uh, individuals and organizations in the community, we were just really pleased to recognize Mo Young uh, for um, being awarded the Martin Luther King Jr. Community Leader Award from the City of Eugene Human Rights uh, Commission. So that was a great thing. And, and a wonderful speech that Mo gave. Um, 
I told her, you know, brief and to the point, and she just she just did a fantastic job of of uh, uh, inspiring folks and the great work that she does. Uh, finally, I'll share with you the we have a lot of work going on on our strategic plan, and the board has a work session tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Um, it's open to the public. It'll be televised. We'll have Portland State University there. Uh, we've had over 500 responses uh, from employees uh, as part of our uh, employee survey uh, that went out a couple weeks ago. And so we'll hear uh, some of the responses there. And we just yesterday sent out a, a community survey. So encourage commissioners. We sent that out to all the community contacts that we have, but really encourage you to send that on to contacts that you have in the community and ask people to respond to that. And we have uh, a community uh, open house tomorrow evening here in Harris Hall, uh, Wednesday, January 24th, 5.30 to 7 p.m. here in Harris Hall for residents. And then we have two employee open houses uh, tomorrow afternoon, Wednesday, January 24th, from 2 to 3.30 at Charnelton, and um, Thursday morning at 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. here in Harris Hall. Those are available for employees who want to stop by and provide comments about our strategic planning efforts. So look forward to continuing that. That's all I have. Great. Any questions? Oh, Mr. Chair. Sure. I just wanted to mention that I have had some um, constituent email on the topic of the um, uh, the property tax um, um, ballot and uh, the boxes that are used for the property tax collections and the voting. Um, and just wanted to remind people that the mail delivery to the assessment taxation office or the mail delivery to the elections office, uh, it's not a function of when you put this into the mail. It's a function of when it's received. And so um, there are people who have voted or there are people that have tried to pay their property taxes and they've put it in the mail. And the issue is, um, did they mail it in time? Well, it doesn't matter whether they mailed it in time because there's no in time. <laughs> it's did it re get received. And so I think people have a misunderstanding of the idea that there's a deadline to mail your property taxes or there's a deadline to mail your ballot. And it's really a matter of did your money get there on time and did your ballot get there on time? And I think we need to rethink the idea of telling people that there's a mail deadline. Like, I think it's common that, that in order to help people, and it's done for a good reason, right? Don't mail it after X date. But even if you mail it before X date, Friday, before a Tuesday election, it's still not going to count if the mail is not delivered. And we had this come up uh, in the... Uh, protest over uh, the Postal Service's decision to scale back the mail processing center because people have the idea, well, it's called vote by mail, right? And we mail, as counties, we mail the tax bill to the taxpayer and we say, here's the envelope, mail it back to us. Well, really, you know, yes, most of the time the mail is delivered, but sometimes it isn't. And if it isn't, then it's not going to count. Your vote's not going to count, and your tax payment isn't going to be considered timely for whatever period. You're not going to be eligible for that. that. So, you know, we really ought to be talking about bring it in you know, and drop it off rather than mail it because it is miscon misconstruing what really is the deadline. Uh, the deadline is receipt. And I know the legislature's toyed with the idea of looking at, uh, at least for vote by mail, looking at the idea of when is it postmarked. Because after all, that is the rule in the federal system. You postmark your income taxes on April 15th, and it doesn't matter when they get there. It, it could get there three years later, and you've complied with the requirement that you've got your check in the mail. That's not the rule in Oregon. And a lot of people don't understand that difference. So I, I just think we ought to rethink. I know Devin's back there working away. And 
got a lot of important things to do. So we'll just, <clears throat> Steve and I will mention that we had this little colloquy today and that it's worth pointing that out because I got a really angry email from a constituent um, and, and I said, well, that's the current rule. If you want to change it, you know, let me know. But that's the current rule. Thank you. Any other questions for the county administrator? If not, we'll move on to item 8A, which is announcements uh, under commissioner's business. Any announcements from commissioners? Commissioner Lichen. Real, real quickly, Mr. Chair. So last week, um, while the, uh, we had folks in D.C. as part of the United Front, um, the uh, leadership of IAAF and uh, USA Track and Field were here. And uh, made a visit, and uh, we're looking through our community, and obviously, I think they spent at least two days here, and it culminated with a evening dinner, which I was able to attend and be a part of, and um, uh, literally people f that uh, represent IAAF from all over the world, and uh, I know the two individuals I sat sat with, one was from Switzerland and one from Germany, and the IAAF. Chief Executive Officer is actually, uh, I believe he's from France. And um, so it was it was great to hear they're excited. And even though the first, the World Track and Field Games of 2019 will be in Dubai, so 2021, they're already visiting and kind of learning and getting an idea of what the logistics are. What's fantastic is <clears throat> if you ask the leadership of IAAF, they all know about Hayward Field. That's the beat about it. Hayward Field is so world-renowned, and it's it's almost the gospel if, if you're in track and field. And so it's really, uh, when you hear things like that, it's pretty amazing that people from all over the world know exactly where Hayward Field is and have appreciated running on it. And here locally, I was able to visit someone I've known for many years now, Lance Deal, who was the 1996 silver medalist in the hammer throw in Atlanta. And uh, so, um, but it's really great the getting the uh, having the leadership from IAAF as well as track or USA Track and Field here, and getting getting an idea of what to expect. And because we're only three and a half years away, I mean that is pretty close, and it's getting close, and time goes by quickly. So, very happy to be a part of that. And Lane County is highly engaged, and I want to thank Greg Rickoff, who's going to be a member of the steering committee. So he's the, which is kind of the everyday, <clears throat> uh, and we'll be highly involved in that. So, uh, Lane County is highly engaged, and very very excited about it. Thank you, Mr. Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and you know. Commissioner Lykin, thank you so much for your deep involvement in it. You mentioned other people who are, who are deeply involved. You've been a part of this for such a long time. And, and I look at you and I thought, when we consider the fact that for the first time ever in the United States, the game's going to be here. Yeah. You're a part of that. Uh, and you've been a part of that ever since uh, I first met you. Uh, you've been a part of uh, Track Town USA, which is Eugene Springfield Lane County. So, um, and I don't expect my former schoolmate Seb Coe was here last week. <laughs> he was not. <laughs> he was not. We, we're both from Sheffield, England. Uh, have you ever heard of Seb Coe? Sebastian Coe? Great 800 meter runner. Yeah, he, he was a good miler in his day too. Yep. <laughs> um, uh, and I, you know, I was the same height as him, the same weight as him, so my wife had a, a t-shirt made that had my face on it and said Sebastian Coe. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Seb. Um, the uh, I just wanted to mention something that's happening tomorrow morning. Uh, the uh, the um, young professional, uh, young emerging professionals, um, the vast uh, for a reenactment of the state of the city from Springfield, the state of the city from uh, from Eugene, and the state of the county from Lane County. So tomorrow morning at seven o'clock, there's going to be a reenactment of each of the three states of hopefully all three of them compacted pretty significantly. But it's going to be kind of fun because I did not get a chance to listen to either Mayor Venice or Mayor Lundberg's state of the, the cities. So it's going to be kind of fun for the emerging young professionals and an opportunity to, um, for them to hear all at the same time the state of the at least a highly populated part of the region, which is Lane, Eugene Springfield and Lane County. 
Um, and then second, um, Commissioner Ann Schuster from Benton County has asked me to join them tomorrow. They're going to be looking at their poverty and homelessness response, and they do a very good job uh, in Benton County. And, and uh, we'll be talking about the things that we've done in Lane County as uh, addressing poverty and homelessness, uh, particularly our poverty and homelessness board and some of the uh, some of the great work that that uh, not interjurisdictional. But, um, but multi-jurisdictional board has been doing. So that's going to be kind of fun. I'll give a report back on that. And Mr. Chair, I will also give a report on the uh, United Front trip, which was uh, far exceeded my expectations as far as the accomplishments that we achieved last last week in Washington, D.C., uh, with Willamette Lane Parks District, with uh, Springfield School District, City of Eugene, City of Springfield, and Lane County. Uh, we got a lot accomplished. So, and I will have a full report on that. Thank you. Great. So if there are no other announcements, I'll just note that I'll be attending the uh, Lane County Mayor's Roundtable tonight in Cottage Grove. Okay. And, and I, if I can get down there early enough, I might <clears throat> sneak into the Science Pub for a little while first. <laughs> um, so, uh, and I'll report back on that next week. We've got multiple items on the agenda for tonight. And um, also, um, last week was Public Safety Coordinating uh, Council meeting, and one of the things they're going to be looking at this year is going in depth into our 10 year public safety plan and figuring out where some of the different um, agencies and programs fit and, and where they are in the you know maintain service level, restore felony um, response, and then whether they're back at getting back towards full and, and getting some gauging in that. So there'll be more discussions about 10 year public safety plan as we move on this year in the Public Safety Coordinating Council. So if there are no other announcements, we'll move on to item 8B, which is agenda team requests. And I want to start with the, the past request that we all agreed to, which is the uh, work session for placing possible ordinances on the November uh, 6th election ballot for um, both the community rights uh, and the uh, aerial spray issue, and it would what we were looking at in agenda setting was, you know, it's it's probably because there's this that both initiatives have been approved um, as far as number of signatures go, but they're both um, hung up on the issue with separate vote through Judge Rasmussen's order back from last year, uh, and that's playing out in the court right now. There's a possibility that the Petitioners prevail and it ends up on the May ballot, which would make a necessity for a work session moot. So one of the things we looked at was probably no need to hold a work session before the deadline for the May ballot at, at the very least. But then we, as we start talking about we're actually proposing to do this for the November 6th ballot, the drop dead date for us to file language and, and ballot title is August 17th, if it's a county referral of, of the ordinance. So so it seems to me that maybe, uh, and there were probably um, is going to be an appeal of Judge Rasmussen's February 2nd, you know, he's going to hold the hearing on February 2nd, probably issue a decision sometime in the next week or two. There'll probably be appeal of that decision, and we probably want to let some of that play out because um, there's still a possibility that the initiative as a charter amendment may get through higher court levels and then get ordered to be placed on the November ballot if it's if that resolves prior to August 17th. So I think we probably would have a better idea of where that legal case is sometime you know later in spring than than just you know past the March deadline for for the the May. Uh, Election. So I was looking at, and in discussion with the rest of the agenda team, we were looking at late May, early June for the work session, which would give us over two months to final. You know, if we decide to place on the ballot, finalize language, hold public hearings, et cetera. Um, but that sounds like it's pretty far out, and I wanted to explain that one publicly rather than just announce that we've we've we're, you know the date's going to be June whatever or May whatever. Um, and then everyone go, why is it so long? I wanted to make sure people understood some of the, what our thought process was in the, in the agenda setting meeting. 
but I also want to hear from the rest of the board because this is, you know, obviously we've spent five hours of public testimony over this. There's high public interest. I want, you know, I didn't feel comfortable just to the board of commissioners, as, even if we are the agenda team, completing that decision process in not a public manner. So that's one of the reasons why we chose to bring it back in, a, in an open session to discuss. So um, any thoughts around that? Um, that, you know, thinking about a, a late May, early June timeline, or is that any, any, any discussion to that? Commissioner Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for the explanation of the timeline. I, I just want to make certain everybody who is interested in this, every single person, whatever their point of view may be, is interested in expeditious discussion, expeditious uh, answers. Is that the right? Yeah. Adjective? Good. All right. Thank you. Um, so uh, we, we're all interested in finding out as quickly as possible. And uh, so it seems that the February 2nd date is a critical date. And that is when uh, Judge Rasmussen uh, uh, has the hearing. And uh, ultimately, within probably a week or two of that date, we'll make, render a decision. Um, the decision, whatever the decision may be, is, will, is likely to be appealed by who disagrees or dislikes the decision, I would guess. Is that is that a correct? Uh, it's probably assumption? a safe assumption. A safe assumption. Okay, good. And so really any discussion by the board in depth regarding um, that particular element of the issue, it really has to wait until after Judge Rasmussen has rendered a decision and then whatever discussion subsequent to that occurs. Is that, am I safe in that assumption also? Probably because I think the, and, and I, saw head nods from some of the initi initiative petitioners who were sitting in the audience when I described that their their highest priority is to get the charter amendment on the ballot. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then the secondary priority is to have an ordinance. Okay. So, you know, I think, you know, waiting for the decision points for the charter amendment moving forward before we start discussing placing an ordinance mm -hmm. um, makes some sense. Excellent. Then, okay. um, then I'll, I'll just restate what I said earlier, and I'll, I'm looking at you, Ms. Mokar Heisky, because you're looking at everybody, so I'm, you're, you're my mirror here. Yeah. Um, we all want it to happen as quickly as possible, absolutely as quickly as possible, so people's questions are answered, and so that the speculation uh, becomes uh, absolute. You know, when we speculate on things, who knows what, what the correctness is of the speculation or what the likelihood of the outcome of the speculation. So that being said, I, I'm hoping and expecting that we'll move as quickly as possible on this. And uh, the other thing that I'm curious about is uh, something that uh, former Commissioner Rust stated, an advisory vote. Um, I remember I was on the Eugene City Council for a long time, and uh, advisory votes were sometimes used a couple of times on the uh, West Eugene Parkway, and the City Council ignored the advisory votes. So, you know, um, a subsequent speaker said advisory go votes are good, but they have a downside to them. Advisory votes are good, and we don't have a West Eugene Parkway, even though the advisory votes overwhelmingly said build it. So um, that, uh, all that being said, um, I'm... I'm uh, hoping and expecting that we'll move as absolutely quickly as we possibly can to, to get some form of resolution that everybody at least understands the answer and believes the answer rather than uh, speculates as to what the answer should be. Thank you. Commissioner Sorensen. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll make this brief. I, I really am um, opposed to this strategy. Um, I think that um, the advocates came in and they had a pretty simple request now was that uh, that the board have a work session on referrals there was no mention whatsoever uh, i don't think of of the timeline of the initiatives the initiatives will be tied up in litigation uh, the fact that the circuit court's holding a hearing on february 2 doesn't mean that we'll get a decision on february 2 might get a decision in mid-february fairly soon it's not like they're delaying things but it's going to take time and then the people that are upset about that will appeal that decision to the court of appeals and court of appeals will in due course uh make a decision so to me uh this this uh, you know merging the initiatives with the idea of a referral 
complicates things. We know that there's a schedule uh, that the state has given us for when we can have elections. Uh, people have asked us to have a work session. Uh, in my mind, they didn't ask for a work session uh, in January to be held in May. Uh, they asked for a work session in January to be held in January or February. Um, and so to me, this is uh, not showing much interest in the referral concept to to be a way to uh, to get a public vote on something. And it, to me, if, if the board doesn't want to do it, let's just say we're not having the work session, okay? Because to me, not having a work session in January, not having a work session in March, April, and then saying, oh, late May, we're going to have a work session. To me, why not just say, at this time, we're not having a work session. We'll see what happens with the litigation if people uh, appeal the judge's decision. We'll have to consider it at that time and just be direct with people. We're not having a work session. So to me, um, I think, you know, the idea of saying we're going to have a work session in May is not having a work session in a timely fashion. And I think there's going to be uh, substantial blowback to this once the public is aware of it. So um, you want my opinion? That's my opinion. Why not take a good idea, which is to have a work session, involve the advocates for the, for the referral, have them come in and have a work session on whether this is a good idea or not. And, and, and don't get, confuse it with what the state law is, what the federal law is, what the courts might do about an initiative. All that is separate from having a referral discussion. Completely separate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, the, good discussion. Uh, I, I, I guess I need a little bit of clarification because a part of the reason for the work session is to, uh, is to take what the courts say and apply it to actual action. And Commissioner Sorensen, it, I, we don't involve ourselves in back and forth dialogue, but I'd, I'd like a little bit, bit of clarity. What would the work session, other than just a discussion about the referral process, what would the net result of it be? What, what would be the, the, the decision point at the end of the work session? Understanding that the work session doesn't necessarily lead to a decision point, what, what are we trying to accomplish with the work session? Is it a discussion of the referral process, which we all agree is, you know, Oregon's law is Oregon's law? Um, and is separate com are you suggesting it's separate completely from the two initiatives that have been circulated? And the work session would be just around the referral process in general? Well, my view is that um, a number of people came forward and had an idea. And that idea was we would like to have two measures put on the ballot by the board We'd like to have them in the form of ordinances so that they can be changed. And we'd like to have a work session to discuss how to do all that and whether or not the board felt it was a good idea to do that. Mm -hmm. So to me, you know, to answer your question directly, I think we ought to pick some of the more uh, uh, active people that have come in that seem to be prepared and seem to be knowledgeable about how this would go have them come in, have a work session, have them sit down, explain what it is they would want to do. Um, one idea is do we put two of them on the ballot or do, we, or do we look for one that the board thinks is a reasonable ballot measure? Um, another, which was just brought up today, is the idea of it not being a, um, not being a uh, um, ordinance but it being an advisory vote. Well, what's the pros and cons of that? And to me, uh, you know, it takes time to do this. So the out, you ask, well, what's the outcome? The outcome likely in most work sessions is another work session, okay? And that's one of the reasons I'm concerned about tying this up with somebody else's calendar, somebody, the court system's calendar, is that we don't really have any control over that. We have total control over our own. And so to me, one outcome is uh, either we have another work session or we just all can agree that, yeah, we ought to put one or both of these on the, on the ballot. And by the way, there's also a legal component to this. Just because the 
uh, advocates have come in with their proposal doesn't mean that's something the county council has reviewed and it doesn't mean that the county council that the form it's in is something that we can put on a ballot so we need to make sure that we ask that question as well and so the county council's got to be part of that work session but you know you know like i said if there is an interest in this let's just drop it and say you know you ask for a work session we're not giving you a work session okay we're just not doing it. And I think that's wrong. I think that's bad. I think they came up with a perfectly reasonable idea, and we ought to follow up on it. Thank you for that deeper explanation. I, I have both of the uh, ordinances recommended uh, ballot items um, that have been forwarded. I have them open right now. And uh, I would not be ill opposed to that, Commissioner Sorensen, to having a work session that's specifically about that, and, but understanding that, um, that when the judge renders his decision, that that particular avenue is based upon a, uh, um, a decision by the court. So, so your, the work session that you're thinking or that you're suggesting is one to just discuss potentially the uh, two um, recommendations that have been forwarded by the advocates who've been discussing and, and they made them as ordinances see they they made yeah. them as ordinances now the yeah, initiative did. is about is about charter amendments uh -huh. okay yeah and 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 that's going through the court system okay okay yeah. the other is a lesser type of law mm -hmm. a charter is one thing an ordinance is another thing yeah that's what they proposed and both of them are called ordinances yeah and uh, and both of them uh, would be a part of the discussion would be are we willing to put any ordinance recommendations on the ballot at, at any point in time I mean it's not something that we do very often um, so um, so the work session would be just to, to discuss do we want to put something on the ballot are we going to do it are we not going to do it and uh, here are the two that have been recommended is that uh, correct yes okay absolutely right. okay. so let me interject here the request was to place an ordinance on the November ballot and it was very specific and Commissioner Sorensen keeps leaving that part out the November ballot part out and one of the reasons I think the request was for November was the desire to have the Charter Amendment still be on the May ballot and in my meeting with one of the chief petitioners and several other interested parties they did express that exact motion that they would prefer the Charter Amendment and having us refer an ordinance was a secondary thing to them and, and a secondary desire waiting till May is about not getting ahead of what their primary directive and primary desire is and also is about giving our staff time to have answers for a work session we've put work sessions out in the future as far as six months in the past because we knew there was need for time to get get information in fact this work session we held today on the tax reform the request initially came before the tax reform bills had even passed and one of the reasons why it got put out in the late January was one to wait to see what passed and two to give us time to do analysis you know that that's and I don't think you know and, I, and the date I originally was looking at agenda team was May 22nd you know which is not all that far away you know, we're, we're, we're January 23rd, four months from now. And it puts us almost three months ahead of the deadline for the November general ballot to get through things like understanding all the legal ramifications, holding public hearings, working language, ballot language, deciding whether we're, you know, to put it on, not put it on. I think that is, you know, a fair thing to do uh, and, and gives us plenty of time and honors exactly what the request was which was to hold a work session about referring those two initiatives as ordinances to the November 6th general election. So, I, you know, that also, and that has nothing to do with the timelines of the court case. It adheres to what the request was, which was to hold a work session relative to placing those on as, as ordinances for the November election. And I've got emails that actually have that written into it I've got meeting notes from my meeting with one of the chief petitioners that says in November, you know, it was always no, the November general election. And I haven't heard that change. And I repeated that at the end of public comment. And somebody could have jumped up and down at that time and said, no, that's not what we said. And no one did. So I, I, I don't think there's a need 
to, one, put an added burden on our staff at the time when we're trying to, to redraft a strategic plan. We've got other issues in front of our staff. You know, May 22nd, one of the questions I had and one of the reasons why I said maybe early June was that also falls in the middle of our budget cycle for staff. So we're already, you know, they're already in a major crunch trying to prepare our budget and go through the budget time. So, you know, to, that's one of the reasons why I sort of was wavering around May, June, was do we want to try and push it back after we normally adopt our budget in early June? And, and staff has more time. But I, you know, if, if you want to push it as close as you can to the to the May May election, when most of those issues around the charter amendments should be resolved, I think you know, May 22nd gives us the maximum amount of time. And, and you know, you talked earlier about what's the natural progression, normal orderly progression of an election. We didn't hold work sessions on moving the jail levy onto the ballot a year in advance of the election of the jail levy. We, hold the, we held those work sessions a couple months in front of the deadline, held the hearings in the month of the deadline, so that you know, it was what the public understood was coming before them in the next election. You know, it seems to me as we start holding work sessions two election cycles ahead of the election we're talking about, uh, it gets to be confusing. So I, I, I would support uh, moving ahead with May 22nd as, as the work session date. Uh, and that's my recommendation was actually, you know, sort of the recommendation of the agenda team. But I just wanted it to, 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 partly because I was pretty sure that might, people might think that we're trying to delay this in some ways, but I think it, ha it makes a lot of sense relative to the elections calendar and what the request actually was, which was a, a, an ordinance referral for the November 6th election. Commissioner Farr. And thank you for your explanation, Mr. Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm clearly in, in favor of a work session on this, but there are two different things that need to be accomplished by this. One is the uh, um, the adherence of Lane County to the Oregon law regarding the, the um, initiative process. That has nothing to do with either of the two ordinances that have been suggested to us, and it has nothing to do really with much of the discussion that takes place in this room that has taken place for the last three board meetings. Do, are we, do we, are we absolutely adhering to Oregon law as far as the initiative process is concerned? But significantly, uh, one of the uh, gentlemen who's testified three times now, um, the question for me is, uh, um, are you willing to have a, a work session regarding our request for the commissions to forward the initiative, our initiatives to the ballot in the form of ordinances? Um, and would I support a work session for this issue? And uh, yes, the answer is yes. Um, I've stated that already. And then, uh, but as far as moving that to the November ballot, there, the time frame on that, I think August 17th was thrown out as the deadline for getting a, that on the November ballot. And a great deal of preparation for a work session would need to take place in terms of staff um, taking a look at the two ordinances that have been recommended for one thing. And uh, potentially you're recommending a third ordinance that uh, kind of um, consolidates these or, or makes uh, makes it more um, legally correct or or uh, procedurally correct. Um, so based on that, uh, Chair Bozovich, the May 22nd date is, seems fine regarding a referral to the November ballot. But the other part of my question is, um, is uh, another question that was asked. We would like a tr clear and transparent explanation from the County Council on why he ruled that the Freedom from Aerial Herbicides Bill of Rights Charter Amendment does not meet the separate vote, vote criteria. And to me that is more the initiative process that uh, we would have a discussion regarding the initiative process, whatever the initiative is that's being, that we're moving through the process. So it seems like two different work sessions um, with two different uh, net results. One is specifically regarding the November ballot, and it would be subsequent to Judge Rasmussen's decision, and it would be also subsequent to the May ballot. Um, and the second discussion is regarding the initiative process, which I've been accused of ignoring the initiative process. I don't want, I don't like accusations of that because I'm not, I don't intend to, nor will, nor shall I ignore the initiative process. And so I need to understand, and, it, and a work session seems to be the best way to have the discussion on what is the initiative process and, uh, and why has, have we, uh, let's see, 
ruled that the Freedom from Aerial Herbicides Bill of Rights Charter Amendment doesn't meet the separate book criteria. So I, you know, there's a, a bit of that, this is an integrity issue and a bit of it is a procedural issue. So, um, so I would probably be in favor of two different work sessions. One on May 22nd to talk about two uh, ordinances that have been recommended to us and the second regarding the process that we go through to get things that the people the people go through to get things on the ballot, the initiative process, which we've always adhered to, which brought us measure five, which brought us measure 47, ultimately measure 50, it's brought us all kinds of things that we love, hate, brought us uh, things that um, affect the- 49, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the list goes on and on, and I hate this, I love this, I hate this, I love this, but hate or love, it's not hate or love, it's the process, and at, that we are adhering to the process in a legal, open, and transparent way. So. Let me address your second question a little bit. That second question is actually something that's being litigated right now, uh -huh. and we are represented, and there are other people that are represented, and we cannot have an open discussion of that until the litigation is complete in public. I, I, I mean, that's um, the unfortunate thing about when people have filed litigation and we have legal representation. It's, it becomes very difficult for us not to discuss that in anything other than an executive session, which leads to these accusations of clear and transparent process. But what I will say is the filings on the appeal of the decision about separate vote have been filed by all parties and are available through the circuit court's website for anybody to read. Yeah. So the explanation of why separate vote determination was made and arguments against you know whether they, it was right or not have been filed by both the uh, the initiative petitioner's attorneys by um, Mr. Long's attorneys, who's intervening as a third party, and been filed by a county council. So, you know, that's public record available through the courts. But discussing that in a work session while those that litigation is in process, and here comes the attorney probably to help me with this, would lead us into a world of trouble. This has I'm turned sure. into this has turned into a work session, which, which was which was why which was why I was 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 kind of saying it's not a work let's, session. Let's move it all till further down the road to some degree, and and I think one of the things I do want to note is I want to switch my proposed date from the 22nd to the 23rd because the more we discuss this, the bigger the work session's getting, and and, and, and the 23rd is one of our Wednesdays we're supposed to hold open for work sessions, so I think we could have more time on the 23rd. So go ahead, Mr. Dingle, because you're probably going to help me with what I was just trying to address. <laughs> well, I've been, uh, Chair uh, and members of the board, I've been following the conversation upstairs. <clears throat> and I've also listened to the public uh, comment. And I'm not as clear as I guess some of you are. I've heard people, and quite frankly, it's a very technical area. I see people conflating different concepts. So I have heard two things voiced, people, and I don't know if they're, it's just sloppy terminology on their part. I've heard people ask the board to refer these matters as an initiative on the ballot. And I've also heard a request that the board put ordinances or ordinance and ordinance or ordinances that have been presented to you on the ballot. I think those are the two concepts that have been discussed. They have two very different legal implications. <clears throat> Personally, I think it makes a lot of sense to see, uh, to, to uh, wait for um, the decision by Judge Rasmussen. Again, I think uh, Commissioner Sorensen's right. I, no one knows exactly when he's going to do it, but he was, he's been very prompt and he knows that uh, our clerk would like a decision before March 15th because that begins triggering some things that she has to do. I have every expectation that Judge Rasmussen will meet that deadline. I think the court, I think the board would be well served to see the reasoning uh, and the decision of, by the court in that case, because as again, it would de it deals specifically with, as you mentioned, Chair, whether or not it's going to go on the ballot as a charter amendment, which is what I understand the, the, the part of the initiative is the request for the initiative is are the folks that want it to be a charter amendment as opposed to an ordinance because obviously a charter amendment requires a vote of the people to change ordinance could change next year whenever the board decides to do it uh, and personally as your lawyer that would be advising you I would like to have the advantage of seeing exactly what judge Rasmussen rules whether or not he decides um, <clears throat> 
the measure complies with the separate vote requirement or not and avail myself of that reasoning. So certainly I would like to see after the February, mid-February uh, date that I, certainly by the end of February, I expect Judge Rasmussen to rule. Uh, with regard, and, and as you pointed out correctly, Chair, the, there is gonna be the issue of the appeal, um, but remember that the, the, um, the parties, if they are going to appeal, have to do it within 30 days of the judge's order and decision on the case in February. So, you know, it's going to take probably a week or so after, 10 days after the whatever the decision is issued to do uh, a form of order that would be signed by Judge Rasmussen, which then the appeal period would begin to run and you'd know 30 days from that date whether or not someone was going to appeal. Again, I think that has a significant impact on the conversation. I mean, we can speculate that we think somebody's going to appeal. Uh, they, you know, one party or the other might, uh, but again, um, it would be nice to know that fact for sure. So uh, to the extent that I hope that answers some of the questions that are out there. Um, and again, because I think it's just, I think it's wise policy for this board to find out what um, Judge Rasmussen is going to do. I think it does impact the conversation. So, and I for one would like when we do, when we do schedule this, uh, work session, I'd like to, if you, because I want to be as much assistance as possible to the board, I'd like to know exactly what the issues are because I've been trying to, I've been trying to jot them down as this conversation has gone along and with the chair's indulgence, I might throw a couple of those out there. <clears throat> uh, I understand the question to be, uh, does the first question would be, does the board um, have the authority to refer um, a, an initiative measure that would be a charter amendment along the lines of these two ordinances. Uh, a sub part to that question would be if the board does so, does it still have to comply with the separate vote requirement analysis that, that is currently being litigated in the one case? Uh, number two would be, does the board <coughs> um, have uh, the authority to refer an ordinance? And I think following up on some of the questions you've raised, Chair Bozovich, how is that different than the initiative process and what if any type of liability would there be for the board given the fact that there's a state statute that preempts local action on this? In other words, would that open the board up to uh, some sort of claim that um, they were wasting public funds? Um, I'm trying to think of what the, and now I've lost that. Those are the two that are jumping out at me and if you tell me what the other ones are, I can always go back and look at the tape, but those are the two, two that I've, and all the little subparts that go out from that. I understand that's an oversimplification, but analy fully analyzing those two, two issues covers <clears throat> a lot of ground legally. Yeah, there's been multiple court decisions relative to a lot of initiatives in the past, you know, from Armada to whatever. So it's, it is one of those things where it's going to take some, some in-depth research and, and attorneys differ. As we can see by the current yeah, current shocking. litigation yeah, <laughs> on the interpretation of all that, so and 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 of course, I, I also want to give plenty of time, and particularly because the attorney for the petitioners is is probably spending the majority of of their time uh, looking at the current litigation versus you know trying to make interpretations on on ordinances and and relative. Uh, uh, other statutes in Oregon law, um, I, I think I'd like them to have time to, you know, prepare um, legal briefing to us also because that was one of the requests was to, you know, to get here from them at the same time during this this work session in some way. And then actually the other, that's actually the other point, thank you for reminding me, because uh, the further we go into that process, we're going to have, the, the board would have the benefit of um, the briefing in the Marion County case, which is the, uh, for those who don't know, um, the, the community rights measure was presented to the attorney or to uh, the Secretary of State as a statewide measure, uh, IP55. Uh, the Attorney General concluded that it violated the separate vote requirement. That was challenged in Marion County Circuit Court. <clears throat> Marion County Circuit Court judge said, it did comply with the separate vote requirement. It was appealed to the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals, in a very unusual move, issued a stay of the judge's decision. So the further we go into the process, we'll have the complete briefing from both sides on that matter, as well as the briefing 
from all sides on the matter that's currently on appeal out of um, Lane County Circuit Court. The original decision by Judge um, Rasmussen last April. I believe it was March or April. Because you're right, Chair, it, there are there is a lot of case law and a lot of uh, issues around this. So obviously, again, as your counsel, I'd love to have as much information at my disposal as possible, and I'd love to have the briefs, all those briefs from all those parties. So uh, with that, Commissioner Lycan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, Chair. Yeah, we are pushing a lot. So Steve, thank you for that, that uh, advice. I appreciate it. Um, I think it is prudent that we see where Judge Rasmussen is going to be, where his ruling is going to be on this. But it does not preclude this board to coming back again and having this discussion again on what date. I, I don't know if, I mean, I'm, I have no argument with May 23rd. If we're looking at November, that's fine. But I also think it's important that we, that after Judge Rasmussen makes his decision and, and kind of get an idea of what's going to happen from a, a legal perspective, uh, it doesn't preclude the board from, again, coming back during this time, during the business from the board, and having a conversation by actually potentially setting a date. So I'm, I'm not sure I want to actually set a date yet. I think it's prudent for us to wait to see where Judge Rasmussen goes and what his decision is going to be on this before we actually set a date because it may end up being earlier than that. But it, again, it's going to depend on your schedule. And uh, right now we have a lot on our plate. That's, that's the issue. Plus we're going into budget season. So we have a tremendous amount on our plate. And, and so I just want to take a look at what the schedules will be. One last thing I want to reiterate. <clears throat> I hope folks understand that we are in such an incredible position by having Cheryl Betchard as our clerk. And I'll state this again. I've talked to counties throughout this state, and i got to tell you, she's probably one of the most highly respected clerks there are in the state of Oregon. And her staff is nothing more than, than they do nothing more than being professional. And so, uh, you know, when she comes before us and, and presents these issues, you can almost bank it because of... First of all, how long she's been in that position, her experience, but really just her overall knowledge of election law in this state is, is second to no one. And so I appreciated her, the very first public comment time, her comments to me really resonated because I know that. And after visiting with counties around the state, you really understand Cheryl Betchard is looked up upon by uh, county clerks throughout, and uh, she's held leadership positions in the association. Her peers think the world of her, and I think we should too. She's done nothing more than be highly professional here at Lane County, and I can tell you that I'm highly appreciative of that. So those are my general thoughts. Um, so we have kind of May 23rd as a potential, but I think that it would preclude us to come back again, have this discussion after Judge Rasmussen his findings, um, and see where we are. So those are my thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Williams. I agree with that. <clears throat> Excuse me for the scratchy voice. Uh, it's uh, prevalent up here on the, on the dais. I, too, think it's prudent and wise to uh, wait to hear what the judge has to say for... Uh, Wade too deeply in this, so that's that's where I stand, and that's where I have stood. That's why I've taken a lot of heat from folks that wonder why I haven't made statements regarding this issue. Personally, I think it's uh, improper for me to um, throw that out there. Let the judge speak. It's not you know years away. It's it's pending. It's very soon. Uh, we will have direction um, when the when the judge renders uh, uh, decisions and outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. So I think from what I'm hearing, and I'm going to take and I'm going to look for head nods for right now, just to to say let's bookmark May 23rd as a possible work session date. We'll hold that on the board's calendar, but we'll, we'll we will revisit the scheduling of the work session. Um, sometime probably between 
February 2nd and March 15th when we <laughs> hear more, you know, we, we understand more where the uh, court case is going. And Chair Buzzwich, what I'll do is I'll commit to the board that the, uh, and I think I do this anyway, at least I try to um, not inundate you with boring legal stuff, but the minute that I get the decision from Judge Rasmussen, I'll be sure and forward it to the entire board and mark it with high importance so you know that. So that, and I, I will expect and be prepared to, uh, you know, discuss setting a date the next agenda team after that. The other thing I will say is I expect, based on the what uh, Commissioner Sorensen has expressed as well as the other members, I, I want the board to be prepared. There's going to be a substantial amount of material. That's something else you probably want to take into account. I mean, the, the kind of, you're talking about um, literally, I'm going to want to provide you probably hundreds of pages of briefing between the, not my briefing, but, ex, you know, the because uh, I'm assuming you want to hear arguments on all sides and all the, the different legal theories. So there's going to be a lot of material for you to review prior to the uh, work session. So I just want to throw that out there as well. And I'll, and I'll make my schedule work, whatever. I mean, I do, I would prefer to do things as comprehensive as possible. So I'd like to have as many of the decision points out of the way. I, I'd, I'd hate to go and have a big long thing and say, well, we'll come back. It depends on what the judge rules on this day. And then, well, let's have another session. It depends on whether somebody appeal. It, it, yeah. So that's my personal preference, but obviously I serve at the pleasure of the board. So I'll do whatever the board directs. Thank you. So um, with that, is, is there, if there's no objections, we'll just bookmark May 23rd and we'll come back and look at the, the, the date and possibly moving it forward or, or back based on uh, information in, in somewhere mid to late February? Uh, well, I just wanted to say that uh, I can see where the board is uh, moving on this, but I used did say if there were no objections, I just wanted to make it clear I don't think this is a good approach. I think the people have come in here, they've asked for a work session. They were told they were going to get a work session. And in my mind, there's going to be a lot of things that need to be answered, and we might as well get started on this if there's an interest in getting started on. One of the obvious things is whether or not the board even wants to avail themselves of the power to make a referral, and that is a completely and separate power from uh, the powers in the Oregon Constitution that the public has. And to me, getting going on that uh, now would, would be uh, a better way to do it. If the board doesn't want to do it, I get it, and, and maybe this wasn't even a good idea for the public to come in and suggest it if the board doesn't want to do it. It's, it's a majority decision of whether we do or do not make a referral to the voters. It's not a vote of the public. It's not a vote of a judge. It's, it's whether we think this is in our interest as a government to empower people to bring ideas to us and put it on the ballot. If we don't think it's a good idea, let's, let's cut that off sooner rather than later. And my mind is that we've heard uh, potential objections thrown up like, well, the board might have personal liability if it made a referral, things like that. We can get that out of the way one way or the other, you know. And, and if it turns out that, that we have substantial personal liability for making this referral, then that's where it ends, okay, in my mind. So why don't we just get started with it? But instead, we're not doing that. We're going to say on May 22 or May 23, we're going to have a work session that was requested in January. And, and that just doesn't, that's just not showing that the board's that interested in this idea. And why not, if we're not interested in it, why not just say we're not interested in it? Or let's, go to, let's get to work on it. It's going to take time. And as uh, the uh, legal counsel points out, there are a lot of decisions that are going to come down over the next few months that could affect this. What are we going to do? Wait until September when we're told that there's an appeal on Judge Rasmussen's decision? Then why have a work session in May? Because we've got appeal going on. See, that's what I'm saying. We need to separate this whole referral concept from the initiative totally and get working on a referral if we think that's something that the board wants to do. And, and, and quite frankly, this discussion today tells me, is there an interest in the referral? Is there? 
Well, if there is, let's have a work session. Let's not say in May we're going to have a work session on a referral that has nothing to do with pending initiatives or future initiatives or any other initiatives that the public might want to start. Uh, Why hide behind initiative when the duty is to the board to have a referral or not? All I'm asking for is a work session on the referral issue. And we are going to have a work session on the referral issue to the November ballot like we got head nods for last week. And, and you know, leaving out the, the request for the November ballot conveniently all the time is specious at best. Um, you've heard from our attorney that it's going to take a lot to prepare some, some information relative to some of the questions that have been brought forward about the referral process. What you did hear the board give head nods for, and we're reaffirming today, is there is an interest in looking at referring these two ballot initiatives. That's why we're going to go through having staff put in considerable amount of time and hold a work session on it. And that's what we got head nods to do. So it's not like we haven't said we're not interested in, in looking at referring these initiatives. We've said we will look at it. And we'll look at it for the November ballot. And it seems like May 23rd is about as quickly as we can pick it up with any real diligence. Anything held before then would just be for show. So I, I, I'm going to close this item off right now because we're well into lunch right now, and I'm going to ask the board, pull the board right now. We have executive session and a human resources item that I've been told I can postpone until after the public works items this afternoon. Mind you, we're probably going to be running till at least 3.30 on the public works items, so that probably puts us going up till 5. Stay and do exec session and, and come back out and, and do um, the human resources during lunch hour or, or put it after. I, 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 would, I would think it might be better for us to put it after, particularly in seeing our audience usually expects us to break for lunch and come back. The 1.30 the, uh, is a time certain, though, so we can't put it in advance of the public works. So it would have to be after the public works items. I'm not opposed to working through lunch, but uh, I'm also not opposed to having lunch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's the consensus of the board? Looks like uh, Commissioner Soren's ready for lunch. I'm, but, yeah, I, yeah. I need to get some food. <laughs> yeah. All right, so it looks like we will move items 9 and 10 to after item 12C, and uh, we will recess now and reconvene at 1.30. Mr. Chair, I move.